Now I will turn it over to the impresario of tonight, Man Wang, the creative research fellow at the University of Washington, uh, who dreamt up this whole project, and we are so honored to be working with Man. Thank you so much. Thank you, Edward. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I did not know that we were inaugurating this space, and so that's a really great honor and some pressure. Um, so uh, I've been the guest of UW and Seattle for the last three years as part of a fellowship, the Mellon Creative Fellowship. My background is as a theater practitioner and a performing arts curator, and I worked out in New York for a long time. And three years ago, I moved to California, to the West Coast, uh, because of family reasons, and then uh, a couple of opportunities came up, including this one, and I thought, and I really jumped at a chance to just sort of, you know, really immerse myself in, in, a, in the West Coast and in, in the city. Um, Todd London, who headed the School of Drama at UW, invited me to come be part of the fellowship at Meany and UW as a part of an initi initiative to embed artists within a research university. And um, I really thank him for it and to thank everybody involved in um, the uh, fellowship program. And uh, Daniel Alexander Jones is a fellow, 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 um, who is also ending his um, three years here. Uh, so the question I've been asking since moving to the West Coast, or sort of really started um, deepening the question since I've been moving to the West Coast, is that um, back when I was in New York, my practice and my questions were really about presence and um, bodies and space and being sort of uh, in relationship to an audience, let's say. But moving to California, moving to the West Coast, I'm in the Bay Area, the question was like how art and performance was really contending with these emerging technologies and um, in a larger sense like where we were in the world as these technologies were sort of moving at a pace faster than I could comprehend and a lot of people could comprehend. Um, with forces, natural and man-made, they were larger. And the way that we communicate with each other globally and both intimately has completely shifted. I know. All, so our sense of reality, of space, of humanity, and time scales are undergoing some tectonic shifts. And so it was a real luxury for me when I came from a space of like producing festivals and making products and you know, f uh, uh, shows to sort of just stand still and slow down for a moment and do some research. And I've been talking to uh, I've been able through my fellowship to talk to a lot of people in Seattle, a lot of people um, who are working around the space. So it's been a survey for me. I am not an a expert in any of these things that we are about to talk about, but really kind of I've been fortunate to really talk with experts to sort of gain more and sort of increase my vocabulary about these things. Um, and so for today, as sort of like the, the closing or ending project for my fellowship, uh, I've invited really a, a group of multi-hyphenates, I'm calling them, people who are thinking in multi-directions, people who are multi-dimensional in their practice, and um, they are thinkers and technologists and entrepreneurs, artists, administrators, scientists, scholars, and dreamers who are responding in their own work to these different realities and changing realities. Um, and so, as and thank you to Town Hall for hosting this um, crazy project. Uh, it's from one to five, we have, you'll see in your programs there are uh, different uh, presentations and, and panels. Uh, feel free to come and go, bathrooms, coffee. Um, and so I'm going to introduce to you our first speaker, uh, Janani Balasubramanian, who is a writer, game designer, and immersive performance maker, um, who I met uh, back east, um, and uh, is really sort of expanding, in my, set, in, in my view, sort of the way that we work with science um, and how to make it, uh, I don't know, real to, to um, the ordinary, uh, ordinary citizen, I guess. Uh, so let me just introduce Jen and e, wherever they are. Jenny's right there. Um, and coming up. So thank you. Do you know how to clean a mushroom? You're supposed to polish it like a piece of art. 
the mushroom, so you brush it firmly and thoughtfully, editing, but not too much as you go. The mushroom soaks up water on mass and volume, like your ear would after a swimming pool. A gross, slimy canal. Never soak mushrooms. Instead, imagine that you are Bob Ross at his canvas. A related question. Do you know what dirt really means? Before it was dirt, it was somebody's home. It was the remainder after soil was divided by agriculture and subtracted from sunlight and divided again by bacteria and grubs. Always leave a little dirt at the top of a mushroom. Not too much. You wouldn't want people to think your food is dirty, but you do want some testament to your grit. Food is not a hospital. Don't sterilize it. Lately, I've been getting news about this woman who wants to entomb us all in mushroom death suits that eat our corpses. Another related question. Do you know how the lineage of Greek gods began? At first, the Titans gave birth to some lovely children. And then they ate them to avoid being overthrown. But then, this is the cycle of life. Your children digest you, then you digest your children. For years, people of the earth asked the Titans what gods tasted like. The Titans replied, gods taste like a poisonous mushroom. They'll live forever and threaten your legacy unless you eat them, in which case they will kill you. I'm not saying mushrooms are our children. I'm not even saying that you should eat them, though if you should go through the trouble to polish them, I'm not sure why you wouldn't. But do consider, if you are considering an afterlife as fungus food, you should probably return the favor while you can. If it helps, I will make you a Craigslist ad. Conventional burial is a grave mistake. What happens to your body when you die? Donate it to science. All these people want to become mushroom death suits when they die. Some other people want to become trees. This one old lady wants to be a necklace made of ash or a diamond made of teeth. Logically, it all follows. You spend your whole life killing people without knowing it and then in death, create life still without knowing it. Some people will do anything to prove they're not killing people. In the grand scheme of things, a mushroom death suit is not a big deal. There's this old story, right, about this prince who will do anything he can to escape the cruel fate of getting married because secretly his bride-to-be is a cannibalistic death god. So what does he do? Why, shrooms, of course. He does so many shrooms, in fact, that he spends the rest of his life tripping. At first, the prince has some fantastic adventures. He fights a seven-and-a-half-headed hydra with his bare hands and discovers a floating treasure and a mermaid trapped in an alligator's body. He washes a dog in buttermilk and then eats the dog. The prince meets another prince who is also tripping on shrooms, and they trip on their honeymoon and then trip all the way to the actual moon, which is covered in honey. But then, sadly... Our prince has to return home to his bride-to-be, who is a cannibalistic death god, and she eats him and spits him out the next morning, and they keep on, keep on, this cruel cycle for the rest of his life. The catch, none of this actually ever happens. He just sits in his room tripping for the rest of his life until he finally dies. And then the mushrooms begin eating him, just like his ex-wife. Alternate names for mushrooms. Go. Fish gills wearing a manta ray. Stone Age Russian roulette. Shelter 
for a grasshopper weatherman. Have you ever thought to yourself, how do logs give birth to mushrooms? Why then, you would be barking up the wrong tree without a paddle. Mushrooms are kind of like fruit, just like the ones that toppled Snow White and Eve and Hillary Clinton and all those who came before them. Here are some more facts. Fungi make spores. Spores lead to mycelium growth. Mycelia lead to mushrooms. Mushrooms lead to the dark side. Mycelia are the unthanked underbelly of the entire ecosystem's operation, but mushrooms steal the damp spotlight. But then, this is the reproductive purpose of fruit. So who can pass judgment? I have little else to offer on this topic, except that I hope that one day you will be buried in a mushroom death suit, and you will marry Kate Moss, who will be buried in a moss death dress. And we may not call you gods, but it will be a happy ending, except when she turns out to be a cannibalistic death god and eats you every night. Thanks. I like to do that piece to make sure you're still awake. Uh, and so you think to yourself about what you've wandered into. Um, thank you, Megan, for having me here. Uh, my name is Jenny Balasubramanian. I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I do today and in doing so explore some practices I've learned over the course of my work in terms of how to work with scientists, which is something that I'm still exploring and is an ongoing part of my process and practice for me, and uh, how we as art makers can build really reciprocal and long-term relationships with scientists in particular. So I am going to tell you a little bit about where I work. Really, this should be kind of where I sit. So I am in residence at the Public Theater in New York City, as well as with the Department of Astrophysics at the Hayden Planetarium or the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and the museum actually employs about 100 scientists, so it's a science-making institution. It's not just one that displays science. Uh, there's active research happening throughout the museum, and I happen to be ensconced in the astrophysics department there. So I'm going to lead you through a couple of different axioms, a couple of different postulates that undergird my practice, and in doing so, also explore a few pieces uh, that I've been working on over the past few years, including something that I've already made that some of you experienced either last night or this morning, and some projects that are in process for me. So the first axiom that is really important to me and my work is that form should be driven by content. So let me explain a little bit of what this means to me. So a lot of my practice, it happens in deep collaboration with astrophysicists, yeah? So something, and something that's really important to me as an art maker is because particularly astrophysics uh, is something that a lot of us have curiosity about, right? You can go outside and engage with astronomy in some way because the sky is there, we actually all do live in the same universe. That I think we can agree on. Uh, so there is this, I think, inherent curiosity for a lot of people about what is happening out there. Uh, but the rigors of math and science that are required to, to carry out the practice of astrophysics are often inaccessible to lots of audiences, right? And so I'm interested in creating works that enable more people who have not seen themselves as part of the story of astrophysics, though of, of course all of us are part of the story of astrophysics, um, to allow us to be a part of it. Um, and to me, that requires inventing new forms of performance and theater. Uh, that match the incredible level of discovery, experimentation, and research that astronomers, that astrophysicists are offering us every day, right? Astronomy, to me, is such a generous gift to humanity that pushes the boundaries of human understanding and storytelling possibilities about our universe. And to me, as art makers, that means if we're going to uh, work in cahoots with astronomers, we need to be engaging in some of the same processes around experimentation, discovery, and research uh, around what our own work can look like and what it can do. So when I start making a piece, instead of saying to myself, I'm going to write a book or I'm going to make a play, though eventually I might end up writing a book or making a play, uh, I instead start with the question of what are the central questions and ideas that I want to engage with in the work? 
how do I want to convey that meaningfully with to my audience, whoever that audience might turn out to be? Uh, and then I go about figuring out what form will best accomplish those tasks that uh, I and my collaborators and I have set out for ourselves. So I'm going to talk you through what this actually looks like in practice, one of the projects that I worked on. So some of you experienced this piece, this audio piece that I made uh, either last night in Red Square or this morning in Freeway Park uh, in this magical Seattle weather that we had the past couple of days. So in 2017, I, com I was commissioned and made this piece for the Highline Park in New York City. And the, the piece was called Heisenberg, and I want to talk you through how it came to be, and in doing so, um, explain how the form of something can be driven by the ideas or the content. So Heisenberg uh, happened, I, I, was, I was asked to make something for the Highline in 2016, in early 2016, um, and I had a completely different idea of what it could turn out to be. But while I was mulling over what I was going to make for the Highline, this was happening, and also this was happening, and then finally this happened. And so as Melania's husband was being sworn in, um, I was hearing a lot of chatter around New York City uh, to the effect of people not understanding how someone's reality could be so fundamentally different from their own that they would vote for Melania's husband, right? And I was really interested in that impulse of feeling that someone else's reality, universe, experience of life is so separate from your own that is incomprehensible to you. And to me, whenever I encounter moments of strangeness, curiosity, social upheaval, uh, I turn to physics, right? I think, I assume that's what we all do. And particle physics has particularly a lot of frameworks around really rich frameworks around how to grapple with uncertainty and chaos and upheaval. So I was really interested in physics as an underlying framework for this work. So as I was mulling over, okay, um, we, have, we have physics, we have this moment of people not feeling that uh, they are uh, in the same universe as people who live quite near to them in space, uh, either figuratively or geographically. Um, I was thinking about the work of this man, Werner Heisenberg, whose name the piece took, right? It's called Heisenberg. And he was, uh, he's a very complicated story, but among other things, he lends his name to the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which is a fundamental guiding principle of particle physics, which tells us there is a limit to how well we can understand certain properties of fundamental particles. And I was imagining that as something that was happening interpersonally among us, right? That there's a fundamental limit to how well we can understand one another. And that's not a product of the instruments that we use to observe. It's not a product of human error. There actually just is a limit on how much we can know, uh, which to me is a quite beautiful postulate to begin with. I was also thinking about the work of this man, uh, Italo Calvino, who is a Cuban-Italian science fiction writer, communist, and Nazi resistor. And I was particularly thinking about this short story collection that he penned in the 50s called Cosmocomics, which has this narrator whose name I cannot pronounce because it's a series of consonants. And this narrator takes up different characters uh, across time and across the history of the universe. So these were kind of my storytelling references, the work of this physicist and the work of this uh, innovative storyteller. So as I was thinking about uh, how to actually produce this work. Something that was on my mind as well was the nature of the High Line as a venue. So the High Line is this very slender park that goes up about a mile and a half over the west side of Manhattan. I want to click through actually and show you something before. Oh, I don't have the map. Okay. Uh, the, the High Line goes up about a mile and a half over the west side of Manhattan. And something that it was on my mind was how to make a piece of performance that would not try to compete with the whole island of Manhattan uh, as a product, right? Because if you try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an entire bustling city, you will lose. Uh, instead, I was thinking about how to create something in form that would adapt to its surroundings and would kind of settle in and amongst the hustle and bustle of the city. And so I turned to this form um, that where audience members experience narrative and instruction and music through audio for a few reasons. 
One is that uh, we wouldn't be competing sonically with the city. Uh, and in fact, people had this simultaneously public and private experience. The second is that I was interested in a form that was both familiar and unfamiliar, that was engaging in kind of older storytelling forms and uh, very popular storytelling forms like podcasting and oral storytelling, things that are, are both new, things that have been around for a long time, uh, and was engaging with kind of newer emergent technologies with augmented reality and video games and other kinds of gaming, right? So I came up with this container, this playful container for these otherwise really heavy concepts around dissonance, around feeling distance between us and the people that we inhabit this country at least with, um, if not the world. And I knew that it had to be a game, something that we play and go to go through together because I wanted to bring levity to these these heavy ideas. Um, so this is these are images from the prototyping phase of this project. Uh, where I was trying out what this would actually look and feel like if you brought a bunch of people together who didn't know one another, uh, gave them some audio, and asked them to move through the space of this park. So we created these kind of group as well as individual interactions inside Heisenberg. So uh, then we moved into production on this work. And just to give you a sense of how, um, for me, it was a really exciting uh, kind of new possibility of en engaging cross-disciplinarily within the arts, not just with science, but also within the arts. Um, something that I always uh, appreciate about working with people in different disciplines is how we each start from different places. I, as a writer, start from a place of text. I loved working with all the musicians and my composer and arranger on this piece because when they create music, they start from a place of just kind of uh, brainstorming sonically, which was really beautiful to witness. So I want to show you, these are some images from the debut of Heisenberg on the High Line at nighttime. Someone's holding up a sign for the Higgs boson particle. Say hello. Oh, I'm, and I'll introduce this video. So you're about to see a little clip. Uh, those of you who were at Heisenberg have heard some of this audio already, but you're about to see a little clip with audio that an audience member might hear uh, in during the course of the piece. Say hello. You may now leave your neighbor and go for a walk in any direction. Explore the point. Like I said, the beginning of time is a lazy time. No concern about transforming into this type of matter or that type of energy. At this point, you can lay yourself out generously, like a lawn chair. Yet it all feels so cozy too, like a cabin. It is at once a cabin and a lawn chair. You are in a vacation town, right at the beginning of time. Can you remember the last time you were fully at rest? Stand still and close your eyes. Remember it. Stretch your arms up high till your fingers reach through the edges of our compact universe. Let yourself yawn. Isn't it wonderful? This is the beginning. You exist, you are brimming with opportunity, but you are nothing. In the beginning, all the forces that determine the universe are simply one force. At this one time, at this one point, these are all but one force. She is a beautiful force, perhaps the most beautiful force there ever was or ever will be. She is the boss of the beginning of time. You look up to her, and she's the gentlest, wisest, best boss you can imagine. It will be a sad day when the force dies. That's a little clip of what audience members might hear. 
So, and towards the beginning of the game when participants also happen to be occupying roughly the beginning of time. So the second axiom that underlies my work and will lead me to talk about another project that I'm working on now is that art and science are porous and co-constructing fields. So let me explore a little bit about what that means. So for the past two years, I've been in residence at the American Museum of Natural History with the Brown Dwarf Astrophysics Group. So uh, I participated in this residency a couple of years ago in New York where I was paired with a scientist, and a scientist I was paired with is one of the lead researchers at BDNYC at this research group. And we liked each other so much that we just kept working together. So I've just stuck around, and now I'm a member of the group. And brown dwarfs are these really intriguing celestial objects that are neither planet nor star. And they are somewhere in between stars in terms of how big they are, as well as in terms of how bright they are. And they tend to be quite dark in optical light. So the, eyes, the light that our eyes primarily see in is optical and they tend to be quite bright in the infrared. So we mostly look for them in infrared telescopes. And because they are kind of invisible to, our, to many human eyes, right? They are a fairly recent human discovery. Like we came upon them in the 90s and there's a lot of kind of active cutting edge science that's happening around brown dwarfs right now. And I really wanted to, I, I was really intrigued by the relationship between these brown dwarfs and light, right? Because they're these objects that don't sustain nuclear fusion, that don't burn bright as we see stars burn, right? Um, and I loved how they, I love how they complicate the stories of what we think is out there and call into question our categories of things in the universe, right? And, off, and in turn kind of offer us new metaphors about our own lives and the categories we've put on things in our universe. So uh, the piece that I'm working on now, one piece I'm working on now is called Rogue Objects, and it explores the life of a single brown dwarf who is struggling with a question around its own consciousness, the premise being that it is a dark conscious object in this neighborhood, this cosmic neighborhood of bright unconscious objects. So it's using some of those things that I learned from Heisenberg around how to use audio, how to uh, help audience members, particularly grown-ups, play in a public space together, and also taking to task these other questions around uh, consciousness around our own place in the universe, uh, around how to think about uh, light and darkness. Right? The I think the exciting new questions for me that come up with rogue objects um, versus Heisenberg as a piece is thinking about how, in technologically, to have the audio respond dynamically to audience movement to how they are moving in relation to one another, to gestures they might make, uh, and in doing so kind of create a thing that is more faithful to the science without you necessarily having to learn a bunch of math or become an astrophysicist yourself. You can embody uh, the life and times and struggles of this particular brown dwarf, right? You create this embodied experience of the astrophysics. Um, I just want to shout out this artist because it, it is an intriguing portrait to me of how art and science have collaborated historically. Um, this is a painting by Etienne Trouvelot from the late 1800s of Mars, and he's actually anticipated science around dust storms in Mars that we did not have access to at that time, um, which is... A really, so it's not actually a brown dwarf, but I like this image in thinking about what we as artists can contribute to the practice of science, right? That we can make creative discoveries, uh, then, then anticipate and help, us, help move us forward in the science itself. Um, the, yeah, I will, I'll play this clip for you in a minute. Um, so to work on this piece, um, one of the things I did was go out to Colorado in partnership with the Public Theater, um, and I was in this uh, science and humanities laboratory at the University of Colorado, and we really got to experiment with interactivity, with interaction as a thing that underlies the whole experience. Um, we got to make a lot of games and play with what, um, how audience members, you know, 
uh, interact with each other, interact with the text, interact with the science, uh, and interact with the space around them as well as the outer space around them. I was also really inspired being in Colorado in a place that actually has an open sky uh, because out in New York City we have too much light pollution to actually see the open sky uh, and other kinds of pollution to actually see the open sky. So making astronomical work uh, in a place where you have a more direct reference to astronomy is really lovely. And I got really excited about this piece as an outdoor work, as something that reinscribes public space and outdoor space as a site of poetry and science and possibility and uh, kind of these new ways of having human gatherings. Um, so I want to play you a little clip of uh, one of our experiments, just a beta test of a portion of Rogue Optics. Three, two, one, go. I have thought about this question for a long time. That is whether I would prefer to be conscious or unconscious. Walk with me. In consciousness, I have always experienced yearning. Beyond my horizon, there is something beautiful. The sweet, blissful state of unconsciousness which I want so desperately to be within. In our laboratory at UCCS, we focused a great deal on experimentation, play, and bringing humor and levity to what are otherwise some pretty heavy and scientifically complex questions around brown dwarfs, around our own isolation and role in the universe, and around this fundamental question of consciousness. Rogue Objects is a live, embodied, augmented reality game that explores the life of the narrator, who is a brown dwarf struggling with this question around consciousness. I was very curious about that relationship to light and how to bring it to life uh, with embodied instructions, narrative, music, and sort of that intimate space of the headphones, that audio space that each audience member interacts with. Now look into the air. If you look hard enough, you will see the light wave in the air. That is free unconsciousness, glimmering and sacred. I imagine it as one imagines bliss. Now dance with me. After these molecules dance for some time, they grew in a disc each layer beckoning others to join. They were very fast and boastful, and they were all attracted to the most central molecules, the ones who had begun this dance and were now tightly woven at its very center. And then the central molecules began to burn. At such great temperatures, with such ferocity, they began to burn. That is how the stars were made. Stop now. Let go. Um, I should say one other question that I think is relevant to rogue objects and this piece I'm going to talk about now is thinking about uh, accessibility of the work more broadly, both in terms of uh, the kind of economic accessibility of the work, how do you package it up so it can travel to a number of different places, sites, locations, cities, communities, um, and also thinking about how an audio piece uh, can, um, and a piece that engages movement can also uh, like have a disability justice framework as part of the initial creation of the piece. And so that's an ongoing like research question of uh, Rogue Objects and also the, the piece that I'm going to tell you about in a second. Um, so the third axiom that I think underlies my work and has come to be an integral part of how I think about making art with scientists is that the scientists that I work with are actually as important as the science that they're working on, that they're producing, right? And that the partnerships and relationships that I cultivate are as important as the things that we make together. 
Um, so I want to tell you about one of the collaborative relationships I've built over the past couple of years and what we are working on together. So um, while I was at UCCS working on the working on rogue objects, I wanted to work with a local astrophysicist, and so I asked my network of really awesome feminist astrophysicists who I was out in Colorado Springs that I could work with, right? Um, and they, uh, Jackie, who I work with out in New York, recommended her friend, Natalie Gosnell, who's a scientist over at Colorado College and works on these really beautiful stars called blue stragglers. And I think of her work as kind of forensics and storytelling. She's doing forensics and storytelling with these blue stragglers. So if you look out in the night sky, uh, the, about half the stars that you see as single points of light are actually two stars. Um, because they are so far away from us, we can't kind of optically resolve them as two points of light, but they are two stars. And to, and to us, they look like one, they're actually two. So Natalie works on these stars called blue stragglers that are very, very close to their companions, to their sister stars. And um, over stars have lifetimes, just like you and me. Over their lifetimes, many stars go into this phase called a red giant phase, uh, where they become really bulbous and expansive and red. And uh, in the stories that Natalie recovers of her stars, um, these red giants give over uh, much of their matter to their companion before they finally die and settle into a life as kind of the stellar equivalent of a lump of coal, a white dwarf. And the companion that receives all that mass has this rejuvenated life uh, and burns bluer and brighter and hotter than it would otherwise. And the blue straggler and its kind of white dwarf companion sit side by side out in the universe. And that is how we kind of intimate that this process has happened. So when I say she's doing forensics, uh, stars, the lifetime of stars is well outside the lifetime of any astronomer or of even human life in general. So what she's doing is looking at the white dwarf and blue straggler um, and thinking of it as a giant marquee that says to us something interesting happened here. Uh, and from that, we've recovered this story that this mass transfer happened over hundreds of millions of years, uh, which is the equivalent of like five minutes to you or me um, if we had the lifetime of a star, but over hundreds of millions of years in, in cosmic time. Um, so we wanted to make something together while I was at UCCS that was just animating the stories of blue stragglers and their companions, which was... Uh, Obviously exciting to Natalie because she spends a lot of her research time on it, um, but also really intriguing to me as a storyteller, uh, thinking about new metaphors around partnership, companionship, death, um, youth, age, right? And uh, the this is just a piece from Hilma of Clint that I like, so I just wanted to put up another prophetic artist of our time um, who's thinking about companionship and duality. Um, so this is us in... Colorado kind of experimenting with this movement-based game back in September. And then uh, we liked working together so much that we kept working together. And so Natalie came out to New York in December and we had a little workshop where we tried out a bunch of activities to help uh, bring people into the story of Blue Stragglers and who they are and what storytelling possibilities they offer us. And in December, we created something that was exciting, right, that had some, like, game elements, and we also had some uh, storytelling activities for the participants who came. Um, I think, and it was really um, fascinating to test the piece with both uh, astronomers locally in New York as well as with people who primarily inhabit the theater and see how those two different audiences interacted differently with the work we were creating. I think something we were itching for at that time was still how to make something that would be a bit of a chameleon, like a piece that would live equally well in a science center and a classroom, and also be able to reach a theater audience um, and feel very comfortable there. So that's what we were looking for in the next phase of our development. So actually about a week ago, I was in Colorado working, in, working on uh, this piece with Natalie, which we have come to call The Gift. And uh, we created this form where uh, participants who arrive in the space are offered an illustrated book 
um, because there's something really private and intimate about the stories of these stars. And to me, as a reader and a writer, uh, books are really pleasurable and intimate and lovely experience. And I wanted to bring that into the world of performance, right? The experience of reading. Um, and they also experience audio, uh, which invites them to undertake, to make the book also social experience. So it becomes at once a private and social experience. Um, the So we prototyped a bunch of different versions of the piece. I think something that has been really uh, great to bring to scientists is showing uh, just how experimental and discovery and research-based art processes can also be. Because I think people have this false notion that science is about experiments and art is just about making stuff. But art is also about experiments and research and discovery, uh, just as much as science is. Um, and our processes of how we do that can be in conversation with one another. Um, and I learn a lot from scientists about how they go about the incredibly creative, generative process of their own research. Um, uh, the piece that we're working on now, what you're going to see is a kind of really rough prototype, like imagine stick figure to Michelangelo's David kind of prototype, right? Really, really rough draft of what we want to eventually make um, in terms of this kind of beautiful handmade book and um, kind of magical possibilities within it as an, as an object that you receive during the performance. Uh, but I think it's a pre it gives you a pretty good sense of some of the themes we're exploring, some of the ways that audience members might interact with each other. So here's a little trailer for the gift. I did not always look as I do now. I'll show you who I am, but first I want to tell you the story of my life and how I came to be. Will you set down your book and cover your eyes with both hands? Consider the gravity which binds your feet and the ground. It's crucial you understand gravity to understand the story of my life. Look around. Consider the gravity between you and all those who surround you. Begin so close that your hands could be touching. Will you stand just feet apart and orbit one another? And then faster and faster. My life is a long life, but this body I have now, it came to be in merely a half a million years. To you, in your life, that would be a matter of minutes. The universe is a place of many stories. To you, a library. To me, a galaxy. This is the story I choose to tell you. Be willing to lose yourself to the ecstatic reaches of outer space. Close your eyes. That is gravity. Gravity which binds together planets and stars and dust. That's it. I think we have time for a couple questions. If anybody wants to say anything. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, I think there's a, so something that I think about often, like existing among scientists, is that how a lot of science communication happens to the public and how we are taught a lot of science uh, is as if science is static um, and it's a set of facts and it's unmovable and unchangeable. It's an objective thing. Um, I think another thing 
and um, the way that scientists, practicing scientists experience science, um, I see as something that has kind of trans has transcended that, right? For them, science is a conversation. It's something that's constantly evolving. They have this relationship to truths in science that is uh, actually more fungible, um, that is more interesting and dynamic. To get there, they have had to move through the rigors of the mathematics and the data and the analytics um, because anyone who is an astronomer is also a data scientist and a coder and a mathematician and a physicist, right? You have to do all of those things to be an astronomer. Um, and to get to that place where you're able to then experience the sky as a place of stories and poetry and drama, you have had to move through and continue to move through the rigors of the mathematics and science. So what I attempt to do in, in terms of how the guiding North Star of my work is try to help audience members inhabit that place of even if most of us are not going to go out and become astrophysicists and move through all the math and science required to get to that, how can we immerse ourselves in some of the beauty and poetry and story um, that being a practicing scientist offers us uh, rather than offering a watered down version of the math, right? Or seeing here's this kind of shoddy explanation of what's going on out there. Um, instead, how can we um, be immersed in the storytelling uh, possibilities, which is what a lot of astronomy ultimately is, is invested in looking at things in a zillion different ways, using a zillion different tools, um, taking so little information and crafting these incredible narratives uh, about things that are out of scale for us in space and time. Um, so I want to bring that to audience members who experience the work. Mm -hmm. in public space. And I have a few questions. Um, one is, um, is the removal of a sense or the enhancement of a certain sense like critical to, like what if, what do you see as um, necessary to kind of let adults play and encourage them to play? Mm -hmm. And if the removal is, you know, a, a enhancement of a sense, what is that? Um, one thing that helps is setting up games, then you create the conditions um, for them to play. I think the thing about removal of a sense is really interesting. Like creating some private space inside a public space, yeah, for sure helps adults feel like they have then some permission to play. Um, yeah, I'm interested in when, I mean, everybody experiences permission to play very differently. Um, and, um, I'm interested in how people, like everybody will engage with this work differently in, in terms of how, um, whether they take something as an invitation or a demand or a suggestion. Um, but my hope is that if you create conditions with some stakes and some motion dynamics, possibility, right? Things that kind of really take their cues from what is physically, astrophysically happening, um, then, we have a, then adults like the things out in space, right? Like specks of dust and gas um, feel that kind of permission uh, to be in public space in a different kind of way together uh, that young people are in all the time. Um, we just have to relearn how to do that. Cool. cool. Thanks, man. Thanks, Janine. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so I would like... I met uh, Tommy Zool as I was um, going to a class <laughs> as part of um, the DX Arts program. Uh, I was uh, sitting in on a couple of, of lectures, and uh, I was very struck by his work um, as both a neurobiologist and as a musician. So in the class that I was, uh, what do they call it? Auditing? Um, uh, it's been a while since I've been in college. Uh, 
Uh, at this part of the class that I was auditing, uh, he uh, talked about his work uh, with the encephalophone, which uh, he will be uh, telling you a lot more about. But I was just really struck by um, Thomas's work, both as a scientist and a neurobiologist, um, and how he was uh, really combining that work and his love for, for music. And uh, this particular uh, research and program, uh, I, I thought was really a, uh, I just thought it was a really great example of how uh, art and science really sort of come together, and not just for artistic purposes, but also for um, uh, other sort of uh, purposes that he will talk to you about. And um, do we have, great, fantastic. So his computer is set up, uh, so please welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Duell. All right, I think I got this mic. Wow, that's uh, well amplified. Um, thanks for coming here today. I'm going to be talking about uh, my invention called the encephalophone that she mentioned, uh, which is a, a musical prosthetic brain-computer interface, so essentially allows you to create music in real time without having to use movement. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of our scientific development and our artistic and musical development of that. And then uh, we're going to have a couple of um, our brain musicians come up in a little bit and uh, talk to you about their experience with it. So just as background, she mentioned briefly, but I'm on faculty at the University of Washington in the DX Arts program, uh, which is digital art and exper experimental media as well as a school of music. And I run a lab called the Art and Brain Lab there. Um, and I've taught this class called Art and Brain. And it's a lot of um, some of the themes you've been hearing already. Uh, a lot of my work really involves bringing together art and science in a way that uh, hopefully is synergistic. Uh, they are often siloed and kind of separated out. So it's really great to see other people incorporating and trying to bridge art and science because they have a lot of commonality and a lot to be learned from each other. And that's what we try to do in the, in the lab. Um, I'm also a composer and a musician and jazz, and um, I, uh, I'm a practicing neurologist at Swedish Hospital uh, where I'm a, I'm a hospital neurologist, so I see people who come into the hospital. I don't have a clinic, but I see really acute neurological injury, so um, more, more severe neurological problems such as stroke, uh, brain hemorrhage, um, seizures that are out of control, things like that. And then in my spare time, I uh, like to take nice long walks on the beach and uh, read EEGs. So I'm, I also do neurophysiology for the, uh, for the hospital, uh, which basically is mostly uh, reading EEG studies. Uh, a lot of this work is uh, possible from a a grant which we're near the end at of uh, from the National Endowment of the Arts. It's funny, a lot of this work, uh, I'm, I'm probably most highly trained as a neuroscientist, but I've gotten most of the funding from arts organizations, um, although we're certainly pursuing um, more medical and science uh, grants. Uh, but a, we got a, a large grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, and by large, I mean large for for the arts, <laughs> uh, but it is a generous grant. Um, it's a pretty unique one called Creativity Connects that they started, and its uh, goal is to try to bridge arts organizations with non-arts organizations, uh, including health organizations, and so we got the grant for um, bridging health uh, organization with uh, the arts. So the arts organizations were the School of Music and the uh, and DX Arts Program at UW, and the health organization, Swedish uh, Neuroscience Institute. Uh, my career has been sort of this same problem we've been talking about, this sort of like three different streams that I've been pursuing professionally, and they, they were pretty siloed off. Um, I had my medical stream uh, studying neurology, and then my kind of creative and artistic stream that was a lot of music uh, composition and performance, and then audio installation art. And then I had my kind of science column over here where I'm studying neuroscience, neurophysiology, then complex auditory processing and 
brain computer interfaces. And I'd have been struggling my whole life trying to get these worlds together. And they're, they're together in my head, but they weren't necessarily together in society too often. And, you know, back in Leonardo da Vinci's day, that wasn't that uncommon to put things together like science and art in one practice. But it's more difficult these days when everyone's so hyper-specialized. So um, I've been trying to wrestle these things together uh, in a professional sense, but had, having a lot of trouble with that until I was doing my neurophysiology fellowship. It was actually my second neurophysiology physiology fellowship at University of Washington in Harborview here. And my research at that time focused on complex auditory processing using EEG and also brain-computer interfaces. I was working with a physicist, a German physicist, a very German physicist, <laughs> Uh, named uh, Felix Darvis, and he, brilliant scientist who works with complex signal processing and brain-computer interfaces, and as I was studying auditory processing, I was thinking, oh, I could take one of these brain-computer interfaces and make a musical one that hadn't really been done before. So people had done all kinds of things with sound, but no one had really, no one who knew what they were doing <laughs> really had, had done a brain-computer interface that was musical. So I did that kind of as an art project, and I finally kind of pulled together these two streams, the, the creative and artistic and scientific, into a, into a project. And Felix kind of thought I was crazy and didn't quite understand why I would want to do something with, with music for a brain-computer interface. Um, but he gradually became to not only be interested in it as an interesting problem to figure out how auditory feedback might work in one of these. They're, normally, they're visual feedback. And then eventually, I convinced him that because it's music and not visual feedback, that it actually will be a, a more powerful feedback mechanism and we may be able to achieve better results in terms of accuracy through motivation uh, of music and that it was worthwhile. And he, he eventually got completely converted <laughs> and helped me out a lot. Um, so we created the encephalophone, which I'll, I'll talk to you about. But the encephalophone is, I went the wrong direction. The encephalophone is a brain-computer interface, and so what are those? Those are devices, they're mostly using EEG that try to connect uh, the brain uh, to a device, an output device, without going through the peripheral nervous system. So using an EEG to create some form of control for a cursor on a screen or uh, various other output devices, maybe a... Um, uh, a speller, so this is a P300 speller to allow people to spell things out one letter at a time uh, for people who have uh, disability from uh, various things. So they're, they've been meant to sort of help uh, with different cognitive or sensory motor functions. And we've been doing research for about 50 years. And with surface EEG, meaning a EEG on the scalp not implanted in your brain, still not great accuracy. And, and why is that? Well you know, maybe 75, 80% accuracy if people are really highly trained. Part of it is the specificity of the signal. So uh, part of it is artifact. You, you're listening to a very kind of quiet signal deep inside the brain, uh, and it's overwhelmed with all these other signals. These sensitive electrodes pick up. The muscle makes a huge amount of noise, uh, movement itself. And then we don't, we don't have the specificity of, of knowing exactly what every one of these signals means. If you, if you cut the skull open and put electrodes in the brain, we can get really good signal and then can make some pretty good brain-computer interfaces. Obviously, that's very invasive and <laughs> not, not likely to be doing it for music purposes, but um, those, those do exist and can provide quite good control for people who are completely locked in. Uh, they, they tend to get infected after a while because you're, you're introducing something in the brain, the signal can kind of wander. But for surface EEG, the, the control is not, not fantastic, but it's getting better. Uh, I, we are getting some better results than this already using music, and I think with more and more advanced algorithms and with the proper motivation, we'll be able to get very high level of control with a surface EEG. Um, so I had these two, two columns on the right kind of finally put together, and I still hadn't really pulled in the medical part of my, my pro professional life. Um, I'm, I made this brain-computer interface that 
generated music and when I'm in the hospital, it's a very different world. I'm seeing a lot of people with stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, spinal cord injury, loss of ability from all these things. Uh, and those things are really important to people in terms of their loss of function, really in terms of the quality of life, the impact that has on their quality of life. So of course, if you have an injury that causes a motor disability, a sensory disability, a language disability, these things are addressed in neurological rehabilitation centers. So after they see us for the acute setting in the hospital, they go to a, a rehab center and they're working on these things. And why are those things important? Well, it's pretty obvious to everyone here, if you're not able to move effectively or feel things or speak, that's a major quality of life issue. It's a loss of function, but really what it boils down to is what does that mean for that person in, in terms of their life? Well, maybe because I was a musician, I was seeing uh, a number of patients who had these injuries and uh, lost their musical ability. I was always paying attention to this type of thing. So I saw a woman who was a, uh, a music professor and was just devastated by the music loss. She had some, she had some language disability, she had some motor disability, but the music was really a huge issue for her. Or sometimes it's passionate amateurs who are just music is central to their life. It's a really important quality of life issue. And I thought, hey, I could take this device that I made as sort of an art project that's kind of neat. Um, and maybe we'll provide a good brain-computer interface and help, help us learn about brain-computer interfaces. But I might be able to take that and just right now take some of these people and give them music back. They've lost music because of this neurological injury. I have a means to, to rehabilitate them or at least bring that back to them and restore some quality of life. So I began to use the device in clinical trials I'll talk about in a moment. But this is the basics of how it works. It's a big circle, see? Uh, so we start with the patient. They're thinking about movement. They're not actually moving, but they're thinking about more or less movement. And that's a signal that we can measure. So that gets picked up by the electrodes as just an analog signal. Um, that gets amplified in the, the EEG amplifier and converted to digital. Uh, then we do a lot of the calibration and instantaneous signal power calculations uh, in algorithms in MATLAB. Uh, so what that does is it takes the instantaneous signal power of one area of the brain, the, the motor area of the brain. So when you're thinking about movement, you'll have a certain level of a signal. And if we think less about movement, you'll have a, uh, less of that signal. Uh, we calculate that for each patient and each time. So you, you may have a slightly different motor area than the person next to you. And on a different day, the electrodes might be in a slightly different place. So we calibrate it every single time to make sure that it, it works for that person on that day. Um, and then we get a number from one to eight out the other end. And so that number is then sent to uh, this music engine here, which is in Super Collider. And that music engine, we can generate just about anything. We can use MIDI instruments. We can make a piano sound or an electric guitar sound or what have you. Or uh, really nicely at the University of Washington, we have uh, in the music department, we have disc claviers, which are grand pianos that are MIDI controlled. So we can actually have people play a, an actual acoustic piano uh, using only their their brain waves. So uh, we made this device, but I, I, it was really important to me that it wasn't just I'll put some electrodes on their head and some music comes out the other end and I say, you're controlling it with your brain, brain waves. Um, Cause it'd be very easy. And believe me, there have been many people who have sort of done this and similar type of thing and just said, oh, it works, just trust me. But we won't, it was very important to me that it, we proved that it worked scientifically. So we did some formal experiments, well controlled, uh, where we took novices and uh, had them use the device uh, to try to match notes. So the task is you're given a, a target note and you're playing one to eight notes and you have to hit it three times in a row. If you hit it, you score a hit and we get, you get a new target note and you get five minutes to try to hit as many as you can. And so the percentage that you, that you make gives a, a determination of accuracy. So random, it turns out, is, a, is harder to calculate than you might imagine, but it's, it's about 18%. And everyone in this study, these were total novices, so they hadn't done any learning on this, um, were able to do much better than random 
uh, for two different modalities, and some people did quite well. Um, we also just saw a non-significant effect, but a trend towards more accuracy for people with more musical experience. We didn't power the experiment for that, meaning we weren't specifically looking for that. But it's not surprising that people with musical ability might do better. They, mostly, one thing we know is they're better able to distinguish pitches, so they know if they're low or high and where to aim. Um, so we, we sort of sh showed that we were able to get novices to, to uh, operate this device uh, much better than random, so they were actually having real control. Um, but then it's, it's nice to have sort of able-bodied people do this, but what we really wanted to do is, is show that we can have this work with people with uh, motor disability. So we have been undergoing these clinical trials, which are nearly finished, um, to show that patients with motor disability can actually operate this device as well, even those with, who have some, some brain damage. Um, so we took people with either moderate or severe motor disability, but were still cognitively intact enough to be able to follow instructions, and gave them three sessions. Um, so we were able to see that they not only did better than random, there was one exception down there, he was pretty close to random. <laughs> But uh, not only do they do better than random, but they're actually improving. So they, they're, they're learning from session to session and, and improving over time. Uh, an interesting effect we haven't borne out statistically, but I'm seeing pretty consistently, is that the people who have more motor disability tend to do better. I don't know if they're better motivated, if their motor imagery is stronger because they've been thinking so much about trying to move when they can't, but uh, a pretty consistent trend, and one of the best patients in this group was a woman who uh, was completely locked in and a former musician. She did incredibly well. Just uh, It was really obvious. She was just hitting notes non uh, much better than me. <laughs> so it's been, it's been really satisfying to bring this back to the clinic and bring it back to patients uh, with motor disability. And, and they, they have really uh, appreciated it for the most part. Um, people have really, um, it's just great to see these people be able to play music again when they haven't, and uh, I don't think that's ever been done before in the in the world. So it's a it's a neat thing. I got asked by uh, DR1, which is a Danish national TV, to do a be on a show. Um, so this show is called Simon's Superpowers, and the producer goes and find, kind of finds new technology. Det her, det er en af mine allerbedste venner. Danish, so Han hedder Thomas, og vi har kendt so, hinanden i... Så, uh, this one was particularly special for, the, for Simon, gang, the, the guy on the right. He's the producer. Der var han en succesfuld Because guitarist. Simon uh, played in a der band with this... Alt alt. It was a pretty well-known band in Denmark with this guitarist. Med guitaren. But he had a spinal cord injury about 10 years ago, diving into a shallow pool and had a high cervical injury. Became completely quadriplegic. Uh, he, and he couldn't play music again. He, lo he's lost the ability of his, arm, uh, his legs completely. He's regained some of the proximal muscles of his arms, so he's able to move his shoulders and his elbows, but he still doesn't use his hands. So this is their, his old bandmate getting back together. Hello, guys. Oh, hey. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, nice to meet you. Not the most flattering graphic. We heard about your <laughs> ungodly magic. <laughs> the superpower. The superpower <laughs> of controlling things with the waves of the brain. Brain waves, sure. Yeah, so it's called the encephalophone. Encephalophone, so it has to be a really, really hard word to pronounce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Thomas, so get you plugged in. His name's Thomas, and, uh, also. I think we'll uh, get you gelled up here. It's going to go on like this. <laughs> It's like a swim hat, swim cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how did you come up with this? Now I'm going to turn brainwaves into to music. I started this all as a, as a, as a side project, kind of an art experiment. I, I was studying brainwave, the electrical activity of the brain, and I was playing music, and I thought, oh, I could, I could uh, make a device that plays music using uh, EEG, electroencephalogram. Yeah. And then uh, I'm working as a doctor in the hospital as a neurologist, and I'm seeing all these patients, and I saw uh, several patients who were former musicians who had injuries or strokes that caused them to not be able to play music anymore. And I thought, oh, this, 
you know, this art project I made, this mad scientist project, I could use it to help bring music back to people. All right, here we go. So nice and relaxed, just lean back, keep your eyes open. For the high notes, you're going to be thinking about the clouds and the sky, just completely relaxed and kind of let the note float up high. I'll coach you through it, so I'll talk you through the whole time. So think about the clouds and the sky, just relax. Just let that note float up there. And now you're thinking of the left hand opening and closing. Gripping and ungripping the left hand. Thomas styrer tonerne ved at tænke rolige tanker, eller ved at tænke på at bevæge sin arm. Men når man spiller musik, så er timing noget af det vigtigste for en musiker. Og det er lidt svært at time noget som helst, når tonerne fortsætter i en uenighed. Derfor har Thomas Dual opfundet dem her. Så det er en eye tracker, så han kan lave rests og pauses og lave noget rhythm. Lad os få sat noget tempo på. For med den her incestlofone kan Thomas ganske enkelt med tankerne spille alverdens forskellige instrumentlyde i høje og lave toner. Det kunne være lyden af en guitar, eller som her, lyden af en dejlig xylofon. Prøv for eksempel so the, at lytte efter den her tone. Yeah. So to yeah. Og så er det også ham, and pauses and rhythm. We use an eye tracker to eyes open it's on eyes closed it's off. Vi skal spørge mig. Allows you some, Ganske some much more expression. Et musikalsk mirakel. <laughs> be clear he's just controlling pitch. He's not controlling rhythm with his brain waves he's controlling it with All right. eye. <laughs> ah. Så <laughs> strange. Da 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 min sens og noget der begyndte at ramme et eller andet. Ja. Hvad den fanden Altså, i alt det her syrehed med syre på, <laughs> um, hvordan, var det at, hvordan var det sådan at på den måde være i kontrol over nogle toner, som man måske ikke rigtig fornemmer? Nu begynder det at virke. Altså, vi er ikke engang. Altså, du har lige rørt dig. Det er som om, det er sådan flere superkræfter, der ligesom er inden hinanden, ikke også? Ja. Så sagde til dig, at man får høre, at jeg har jo bare fået sat tingene på spidsen, hvor jeg irriterer dig helt vildt. Så har jeg jo inviteret Alex Riel. Og nogle drenge. De er helt dyre, altså. Ja, øh, og jeg tænker, så, så spiller vi lidt... Øh, altså, jeg spiller ikke jazz, vel, men nu er vi jo i gang. Altså, hvis man tænker superkræfter, og man tænker på, at det her det allerede er i gang. Der er så mange muligheder for, at man kan... Ja, perspektiverne er vildt, ikke? Altså. Og perspektiverne for folk, som har, har hvor livet har udrettet sig, ligesom det har hos dig. Jeg, jeg vil sige, at det her det er jo sådan en superkraft, som... Det der med tankens kraft og jedirid og sådan noget... Vi, der, der er lidt derhen endnu, fornemmer jeg. We will get this translated at some point. Men det, jeg fornemmer her, det er... <laughs> some subtitles, they don't have. So det her, det giver håb for at kunne nuancere stemmen for rigtig, rigtig, rigtig mange mennesker. Og det synes jeg er en super kraft. Men jeg er stadig med sundhed på hatten. <laughs> du må prøve den bagefter, det lover dig, mand. Tak for det. Nå, mand. Ja, ja, det var sgu. Mm. Tak herfra, mand. Thank you, guys. Brothers from another mother. <laughs> So we uh, we've since made some improvements on the algorithms with a collaboration with uh, a uh, a scientist in uh, Austria, Reinhold Scher. Uh, they have a really amazing um, center there for brain computer interfaces. Probably probably one of the best in the world, if not the best. And uh, we've made some improvements in terms of adding sensory imaging to the algorithms, um, changing the integration time that we're looking over sort of the epoch of, you, you, since you can't be looking at exactly now, you're always looking at a few milliseconds in the past and trying to optimize that. Um, different, playing with different bandpass uh, frequency uh, selections. 
And our, our algorithms have improved a lot and our accuracies are going up. And so we're initiating new experiments with uh, healthy individuals to, we're gonna kind of take ringers, so take musician, trained musicians um, who are, we're not gonna have to worry about their pitch discrimination ability and just see how well they can do over a series of uh, testings um, and playing. And uh, our initial testing protocol is for two notes, so they either hit a high note or a low note, uh, the, the tonic or the octave, and if they do well at that, then they'll graduate to three notes that try to hit the, the tonic or the dominant or the octave, and then if they do well at that, they go on to four notes, uh, and then it becomes much more like they're trying to play a melody at that point as, as their accuracy goes up. Um, and then in terms of clinical trials, uh, we're finishing this clinical trial. The next clinical trial would be, well, we've, we've shown pretty well that people can operate this. They can operate it above random. They're getting more and more accurate. They can get to where they start having some pretty good control. But is it actually benefiting them? We know we're benefiting people by giving them music back um, emotionally and quality of life-wise. And that's very satisfying. But we'd like to be able to show that we're actually improving their motor skills or their uh, cognition you know, or forming new uh, white matter tracks, forming new connections. Um, quite confident that uh, the rewiring is happening, but we, we're, we're going to take a look at that with a series of experiments using diffusion tensor imaging, which is an MRI technology to look at white matter tracks. Uh, we're stimulating the motor cortex, so some of these people have a disconnect between their motor cortex and their peripheral nerves. Um, so uh, Jonathan, who will be coming up here later, has brainstem MS, and his, his motor cortex is perfectly intact and uh, works great, I can tell you, because we've been, but it's disconnected from the rest of his body. Um, and by stimulating that, we may be able to form new white matter tracts and new, um, new connections that might help with uh, rewiring. And we, we hope to actually be able to get people to start moving more. Um, so those are, those are sort of the next steps in the next set of clinical trials. And then musically, we've had a few performances, and one recently on April 19th at, uh, at the University of Washington with the two gentlemen I'll, I'm, uh, we, we'll have here uh, in a few minutes to talk to. Um, so we did a performance with original music uh, composed by a composer uh, named Alan Lukes, and we had a, uh, a band uh, and a, a pretty amazing band, but uh, we're featuring these two gentlemen on the encephalophone. So they were uh, playing and impro improvising over um, over original music uh, using that eye tracker for rhythmic expression. And Jeremy, it was a little difficult because he had a he has a uh, eye tracker already that he uses. He's nonverbal uh, by the traditional vocal mechanism that we all use, he has an eye tracker device that helps him spell out words and, and say words, and that eye tracker actually interfered with our eye tracker. So we did manual eye tracking for him, and I just watched his eyes and did an okay job. He, 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 he can tell you I, I missed a few of them, but uh, Jonathan was using the eye tracker that we have, and that's to turn the instrument on and off, and then they're controlling pitch, so they're controlling up and down. Um, rhythmic synchronization is an interesting, there's all kinds of interesting musical problems that came out of this and solutions. Um, we learned a lot, but synchronizing is difficult because the drummer has to actually follow the encephalophone since it's at a fixed pitch. Um, so we used a click track um, and uh, Chris Acasiano was our drummer and he did a fantastic job. He'd actually done that before. Um, and then we had some interesting problems at the last minute with uh, the two EEGs were kind of talking to each other, and they didn't. <laughs> we didn't want them to talk to each other, <laughs> except through music. And they were, one of them was kind of shutting the other one down. So when we had them playing at the same time, we had to we had to make some modifications. But we we got around that. We had to use an old version of our algorithm, which wasn't quite as good. But uh, the show went on, and and these guys did an incredible job uh, playing. Um, another issue is these electrode caps cause a headache after a while. There's just the tension of having the electrodes on your head, and so. Uh, can only have that on for a certain amount of time. So those are some interesting things that we learned from the concert. And I have a little uh, bit of the video here, just uh, a few minutes just to give you an idea. Of what we're doing. That's 
Jonathan on the left and Jeremy on the right. This last one is an epilogue uh, called Wind Chimes, so it was uh, Alan and uh, James together wrote this piece, and it's going to be both of them uh, on a duet on the disc clavier, so they'll both be playing the, uh, they'll both be playing the disc clavier. So uh, you can see the keys going down, you can hear the piano, and uh, I'll let you guys figure out who's who. <laughs> one, one's on one end of the keyboard, and one's on the other. <laughs>
So uh, we just had that concert about uh, just a few weeks ago, and I, I do think that was the first time that's ever been done, so I, I think that was the first quadriplegic music concert ever. Um, could be wrong if anyone knows. <laughs> Otherwise, let me know. Um, lots of people to thank here. Uh, this is a big team effort. Um, Felix down there, third from the bottom, was the um, uh, physicist who really helped me uh, create the original uh, BCI design, and he's uh, he's on a co he's co-author of a patent also <laughs> that we have on this. Um, and there's a huge number of students and faculty at the, at the University of Washington who have helped along the way uh, with improvements since then. And uh, like I said, mostly mostly arts grants, uh, four culture grant, uh, National Endowment for the Arts grant, and Amazon Catalyst. We're uh, we're at the tail end of that. So uh, any any funding sources out there, <laughs> we, we, we need it. we need funding to keep the research going. But uh, it really is a big uh, team effort here. So. I think what I'll do at this point is um, maybe take a few questions. We're going to get Jeremy and Jonathan to come up here. They're going to need to motorize themselves up to the up to the stage, and then they're going to have a, a bit um, to just talk a bit about their experiences uh, for this this whole process and uh, what it's like for them. But uh, while they're doing that, if you have any any questions, be happy to take them. I can't can't see much out there. Anyone? Can you talk about the Yeah, and in fact, so the question was, <laughs> uh, talking to talk about the collaboration with the composer. So I, I actually might have been good to have him up here too to talk about that because uh, it's, a, it's a really unique and uh, experimental, obviously, instrument to work with and to compose music, particularly for for the encephalophone is, is not like composing for any other instrument in the world. Um, some of the considerations it included, uh, rapid key changes are, are difficult. We can change keys, but uh, he had had some, he was writing some songs that were constantly modulating and it was just gonna be too difficult and kind of took away from the actual expression of the, um, of the musicians themselves. If there's too much technology in the way, in a sense, we we uh, we take away a bit from their expressivity, and it's these are all things that we kind of learned as we went along. Um, what was really really nice about this project is uh, we we were experimenting right up until the night of the concert. You know, there's all these unique problems musically that come up, and uh, I really appreciate Alan. It was Alan Luke's second down there. He he really took on this completely unique thing that he'd never seen before, <laughs> and uh, certainly was a big musical challenge. And just well, he ended up rewriting one of the pieces from scratch because <laughs> it, ne it ne needed to happen, and he was just a trooper about it. But um, it, it it was uh, it's it's really quite interesting uh, in terms of um, the musical parameters. One one thing, for example, is that we were. Um, <laughs> the eye tracker itself, you, eye movement can interfere, so we had to uh, we had to do certain filtering to take out the eye eye tracker, so the eye tracker wouldn't actually interfere with the signal. These guys have to be focusing on motor imagery too, and try to r r imagine that with their eyes open, they need to be thinking about movement. While there's an audience in front of them, people moving around, all kinds of sounds, it's very difficult, and it really takes a, a lot of concentration and sort of a meditative state. To make that happen, and it ends up that ends up being a a, a musical complication too. So, Alan did a great job of that. Any other questions? We'll, we'll have. Oh, sorry, over there. Yeah. Uh, hey. Uh, what are the key ingredients in that? Uh, for the polyphonic yeah. So the question was: uh, Do I imagine a a, a um, chromatic or polyphonic? Uh, version of the encephalophone. We've, we've tried playing around with it, so um, right now we have sort of eight degrees of freedom, and that was partially just because I thought I thought in terms of a scale, you know, like a, a traditional like uh, Western musical scale with seven notes plus the tonic. Um, and that ends up being a pretty good number. If we get more, like 16 or, you know, 12, it starts getting really difficult to get the in-between notes. As it is with eight, it's kind of difficult. But 
we've um, we've tried even a, a theremin version where it's just pure pure tone. It just can when you're off, it just swings a little too much, meaning not not swings in the jazz sense, but swings up and down. So it it, it ends up being a bit chaotic. It really kind of comes down to how many uh, how, how much granularity we can have. But we've we definitely had some odd scales. We had a um, an eight tones. Alan had an eight tone scale that was like a uh, harmonic minor with a flat five, and you know it was had lots of uh, traumatic flavor to it. But we, we could do that. But the twelve note scale would be would be tough, just to resolution wise. Yeah. No, that wasn't. They're just controlling pitch, um, and we would like to have them. Be controlling these other parameters, um, but it's a bit like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. We can probably add one more degree. Of, as it is, they got the eye tracker, and they're controlling pitch. That's it's a lot, um, but we were controlling dynamics on that one. Um, and but it, it it does bring up a a really interesting musical point, which is in all of this, the more power we can give the musicians to express themselves, and the less that we're controlling, the better. And that's probably why that last piece worked so well, as we kind of stripped away. We didn't have any other musicians. They just had a simple pentatonic scale. Um, they were in different, uh, in different octaves, um, actually different tempos that were overlapping. But basically, what ended up working best is stripping away as much technology in our control as possible and just letting them express themselves. They can hear themselves better when it's simple. Um, they can express themselves better, and they can kind of know where they are and, and actually uh, create something musically a, a, a better in a way. So simple is kind of better. <laughs> but we were controlling the dynamics on that one. Uh, Uh, well, we'd certainly like, so the question was uh, if we'd be able to replicate it and bring it to other musicians around the country. Um, I'd certainly want to do that. Right now, I have exactly two encephalophones. It's a lot of equipment, and our sort of experimental version is, you know, it's pretty complex, um, so it's not like a portable thing. But uh, we'd like to um, create a commercialization entity where I'd create a, a, a take-home version um, that you know would probably be simpler, but it's certainly technically feasible um, with the right funding. <laughs> uh, but people could uh, take that version home and practice. And in fact, these guys had said after the show, they're like, "That was a lot of fun, but I want I want to have more practice. You know, I'd, I'd want to have more practice. I want to have something to take home. And um, while we might be able to do that with one or two people, or you know, go around the country and do it with different people, uh, it, it really comes down to just the units and how portable they are. So we we imagine creating a, a a portable one with dry electrodes and wireless that you just take home and maybe even making an app for an iPad or a phone. Uh, we'd still need a box because there's there are limits to what we can put in in a phone. Uh, and then have a more therapeutic version, which would be more ones for use in hospitals. Um, you know, be higher accuracy. They would be more expensive because of the equipment, but uh, to be used more in rehab facilities and things like that. Anyone else? Probably want to. We'll we'll be able to answer more questions too if there are some later. But we really want to give these guys um, opportunity to speak. So they, uh, we've asked them each to sort of give about five minutes of. Uh, just their experience with the whole thing, just open, open, uh, open-ended. So I'm, I'm excited to hear what they have to say too. By the way, this is Jeremy Best, and Jeremy uh, has ALS, and he has, he's the one who has the um, the eye tracker. So he's going to have a prepared statement, I'm, I believe, because it takes a while for him to type. And this is Jonathan Sari here, and he has a, a form of. Uh, Brainstem MS, which is pretty aggressive, um, and it's left him quadriplegic as well. He's still able to speak, although his voice is a bit, a bit soft because of, of the muscle control. Who's, who's going first? <laughs> I'm Jeremy. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
So uh, Jeremy and I talked a little bit beforehand, I think. Jeremy's going to talk more about the experience of actually being up there and making the music. And I thought I wanted to talk about what makes this device so important, special to me, and how and why this concert that we did was so magical for me. Um, so I have multiple sclerosis. I was diagnosed in 2005, and from then until now, my experience of the disease, which basically attacks the central nervous system, it's an autoimmune disease. Um, my experience of the disease has been of a just constant slippage of my own connection with the physical world. So I'm fortunate in that my course of MS and MS is, tends to be different for everyone who gets it, depending on what part of the uh, nervous system gets attacked. So with my particular course, my brain has been almost unaffected, but my body has been sort of undergoing this constant slide. And my connection with the physical world has been sort of decreasing and decreasing at this low slip uh, to the point where now I can move my arms a little bit if I concentrate really hard, but no, with no real control. And so for me, the connection that I was able to connect to make through the music with all the people who came to our concert was amazing. Sort of, I sort of imagine the slide of my physical abilities as being like a curtain slowly coming down in front of a stage. And the encephalophone allowed me to peek through the curtain just a little bit more um, and to have the connection of, with the audience that just made it a really magical experience for me. Something that I have a hard time with in my real life. So being able to use that, the encephalophone to make that music and reconnect with people just, it was like, I didn't imagine that I could still do that. And being in the concert just reopened my eyes. And was the experience of doing something I didn't know I could do. Just really amazing. So thanks to Dr. Duell and everyone for making that possible. I'm done, Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. You're on to something, <laughs> You're on to something, yeah, man. Keep it up. You're on to something, yeah, Nani. Keep it up. You are looking at the best encephalophone player in the world <laughs> based on an accuracy test out of a sample size of 50. I had trouble duplicating that accuracy after that, but for one shining moment I was the best. That is the label they gave me and I am sticking with it. Here is a report I filed after the first rehearsal. Excellent encephalophone adventure. After putting the gear on, it is most helpful to quiet your mind, which I find challenging in 2019. Next, time for mental calisthenics as you go from relaxation. Dr. Jewell says imagine looking at clouds in the sky for high notes. For low notes the idea is kind of a mental clenching. The doctor says imagine gripping a ball hard in your dominant hand. 
What is difficult is I find I find I have to relax really hard to achieve the really high notes and clench really hard to hit the lowest. It is hard to go back and forth between the two extremes. I hope to get better with practice. I was, however, able to play along with another musician for the first time in six years, Joy. This was the first of around three rehearsals, which will culminate in a performance with a full band. Dr. Jewell says we were the first people to do this. This is what I wrote after the performance. That was a special night. It genuinely moved people. There were tears throughout the standing room only crowd. I know you like to deflect praise but this project was a success and you ought to be commended. I am wondering what your vision is for the excellent encephalophone adventure. My dream is to someday make an album with encephalophone, Microsoft's music project, and musician friends. To that end I would like to keep in touch with the key players. If you could give me the emails of James, Emily, and the band. A final thought. This was an extraordinary experience. Sure, the musician and me wants more than eight notes and more control of them. I am also working with a rogue team at Microsoft on something called the Hands-Free Music Project. Like this one. A work in progress. This is only the beginning for these exciting ideas and machines that make them possible. My hope is to play a small part in a technological legacy that allows people like Jonathan and I to have a creative outlet for music. The End Thank you both. That was really, really great. Um, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> That's really nice. I think we can actually have some. Uh, we can. They, they can answer some questions. Probably much more interesting to ask them than me. <laughs> but but I'm I'm happy to answer questions as well. Anyone have any questions for Jonathan or Jeremy? Oh, you got one. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> can't see that well. So for me, oh man, for me, I was concentrating pretty much the whole time just to make the music. So, I mean, I'm sure some part of my brain was paying attention to the other stuff, but just trying to hit the notes and, and um, keep control of things required pretty much my full focus. Not hair. Not here. Not hard. <laughs> Not hard. <laughs> By the way, what Jeremy had said, um, so in, in we have this, this accuracy test. He did, in fact, get 97%, which is higher than anyone has ever gotten on it. Um, we had one... A woman I kind of mentioned earlier, um, she got 94% during the actual trial, but um, he, yeah, he, he, he currently has the high score in the world. It's probably been 60 people or so who have done it. Yeah, that's why he's the best. <laughs> and you'll, you'll notice they have their uh, matching Star Wars blankets. They're both Star Wars fans. It's, it's there. It's just kind of folded up. All right, any, uh, yep, I have a question in the back there. Um, yeah, you guys talked about that kind of meditative state. Do you, do you get into a state of flow when you're doing that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've had my best results when I was most in that state. I do a lot of meditation on my own, and I think that helped quite a bit with my performance. The day I got 
my best score on the test. I was calmer than I'd been. So it Not almost, really. almost seems like a measure for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> Uh, I guess I had a question for you guys. Since, so in in our in our final iteration at the last minute, we had to, um, and I feel I feel bad. I think you understood this, but we had to go back to an earlier version in order to get the two to, to not uh, cancel each other out, the two signals. And it, it would be hard, and it'd be hard for you to know. But I was wondering if you noticed a difference or or not. Or I guess the other question is. Our new version that you were using up to that point was different than the ones you had used in the past. Um, did you notice differences between the versions? I definitely felt that on one of the earlier practice days, I guess I was more focused, or that was the best control I felt like I ever had with the device. And that was using our more advanced version. Yeah. Term, but uh, yeah, but we all yeah. know from. Science that that's an N of one, it doesn't prove anything, but, but <laughs> Jeremy. My jewel looks spectacular in this lightweight. <laughs> My jewel looks spectacular in this light. <laughs> Does look. <laughs> Jeremy, did you notice any differences in the versions? Maybe hard to tell. No, no. When you're the best, you get the authority to, to make those kind of statements <laughs> definitively. <laughs> yeah. All right, any other questions for these guys? All right, well, thanks very much. And I'm always available for questions later, too. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thomas and Jonathan and Jeremy. Uh, so we're going to take a well-deserved 15-minute break. Thank you. And uh, we'll come back and then we'll uh, set up for the next uh, two conversations and another presentation. So thank you. 315. Yes. Hi, everybody. So we're back. We're back. Thank you. Um, so uh, here comes the second part of This Is How It Ends, um, Conversations and Musings on Emerging Technologies and Performance. I think that was the title I came up with. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce the panelists for the next conversation. Andrew Kircher, what? What? Andrew Kircher, who will be moderating the old friend. We have a look thing. Um, but he will be moderating the conversation between Annie Dorson and James Coop. And uh, he is an old colleague of mine from the public theater. Um, Annie is an artist of many forms that I've known from New York. And James is a new friend that I've met uh, during my fellowship here at UW at uh, DX Arts. So I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank cool. you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this is really exciting. Thank you, Mayan, and, and uh, thank you all of whom have come together to host this and make this possible. Um, I, it's been a real pleasure the last couple of weeks looking up and getting to know these artists' work uh, deeper. And, and um, so uh, what I had asked was that we begin with them just in the spirit of generosity sharing what they make, um, what they're working on right now, or maybe some past projects that are representative of their larger creative project. Uh, so we'll hear from both of them, and then we'll dive in a little bit into, um, into how they create, like what is their craft. Um, and then we'll see what kinds of conversations emerge from there. Some things that I might prompt, some things they might prompt from each other, and also we'll definitely leave space for all of you. Um, so without further ado, James, I think we'll start with you. Does that sound good? Sure. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody hear me? Yes, good. Um, 
Is it projectron? <laughs> ah, there we go. Okay, good. Um, all right, so I want to, uh, I guess, introduce a few ideas and maybe a project in relation to that. Um, and then maybe over the course of the conversation, some of the dots might get joined between these uh, ideas. Um, first one, has anyone heard of this uh, Amazon worker cage? It's, um, it was uh, something that was patented, I think, in 2013. And it's designed for a robot which would contain a worker and would protect them from other robots uh, while they were moving around inside Amazon warehouses. Um, so it's designed to distinguish humans from machines. Um, then we also have uh, captures. I'm sure you've seen these. You know, where you, uh, you click a button on a website and you say, I'm not a robot. So again, uh, distinguishing between humans and machines. What's kind of ironic about captures is when you see these, these kinds of things here where you have to you know, identify traffic lights or, um, or house numbers or whatever, then you're usually in dialogue with a bot as a human trying to prove, you're trying to prove to a bot that you're a human. And ironically, the images are being used typically to train things like self-driving cars to operate better in the real world. So you're, you're making yourself kind of obsolete at the same time. So there's this kind of interesting feedback between humans and machines. Um, and then I'd also throw into the mix bots. Um, so this is uh, Microsoft's uh, Tay bot, which went badly wrong in about 2016. And it was designed as a, to work on Twitter. And essentially, it trained itself on, on Twitter communities. And it learnt you know, its ideologies and points of view from those people. So you end up with an AI which is learning from humans and then develops all these like extreme perspectives uh, it starts spouting kind of Nazi, far-right uh, stuff, uh, this kind of thing also. So I guess in my, in my practice at the moment, I'm, I'm interested in this relationship between humans and machines or AI and humans and robots. Am I a robot? Uh, am I having to constantly kind of prove that? Um, and to drop in a project, uh, this is um, a piece I made in... 2015, uh, which is called General Intellect, and it uses Amazon's Mechanical Turk service. So Mechanical Turk is an Amazon service that allows, which, which is basically a kind of online workforce of hundreds of thousands of people who you can hire to do tasks. The tasks are called human intelligence tasks or HITs, and they mostly involve things like filling out surveys or describing what's in images, or reading handwriting, basically things which at the moment humans are still better at doing than, than AI and machines. And so this is a big kind of online community, and my, uh, Amazon describe it as artificial, artificial intelligence. So uh, you, when you're hiring these workers, you might upload a receipt, and you get back something which transcribes it, but you never have contact with a human being. It appears like it's happening algorithmically, but you're actually talking to a human being. So here we've got humans pretending to be machines, behaving like machines. So in my project, General Intellect, um, which I just want to kind of throw into this mix, um, it took place, uh, it was installed in a, in a, uh, a condemned school just uh, in South Lake Union near Amazon's campus. It's about to be demolished. I believe it's demolished now. It's probably, you know, apartments for Amazon workers or, or something. And um, uh, what I did is I created a human intelligence task, a hit, which asked workers to upload one-minute videos um, every hour of the day between 9 and 5. And these videos could be anything they want. So rather than doing something that was very prescriptive, uh, some, rather than doing something that made them very sort of invisible, here was an opportunity for workers to do something which was human, uh, creative, expressive. And, you know, it was a, it was a controversial thing to do. Um, on some level, it's 
uh, exploitative, considered exploitative of the workers to, to hire them and participate in their system. But the results, the videos that came through were incredible um, demonstrations of what it means to be human, really, despite these uh, workers being kind of uh, put into systems which, which really attempt to strip away that humanity. Um, so uh, I play, play a, a little section of one of them. So this was this is the school room itself. We had monitors all over the, the building. Hello. It's between nine and ten a.m. Try not to be too frightened. I'm in bed. I just woke up and comb my hair or anything. I'm really tired. <laughs> um, I don't work outside the house at the moment. I work at home, so I don't always get up at the crack of dawn. A lot of times I'm in bed till about nine or something. Uh, I usually try to get up around eight. But it usually doesn't work. Because <laughs> I hit the snooze button so many times. So, I crawl out of bed, 9, 9.15, 1.30. Uh, so here I am, I'm in the bed now, and there's not too much else to say. So the videos continue like this. I, I ended up with about, I think, 3,000 videos from workers, which got divided up in the space using different categories. Uh, all the workers who said they were bored, all the workers who met particular demographics, all the workers, um, uh, all the workers, workers that uploaded the most videos, uh, all kinds of, I guess, uh, big data style categorizations uh, like that. And the, you know, the, they were incredibly diaristic, confessional in many cases, and seemed to really be going far beyond what was necessary to satisfy the terms of the, of the hit. They were looking for conversation. They were looking for connection, human contact. They would talk to the camera as if it was an old friend. Uh, they borrow from YouTube kind of genres in terms of how they would compose the videos, all kinds of interesting things going on. Um, so I just kind of dropped that project in, in connection with some of the other stuff. I'm currently making work with Amazon Worker Cages, bots, and uh, captures. So uh, it's kind of throw that together. Is that good? Thank you. Uh, it's, really, it's a really great project. Um, uh, hi. Um, uh, um, thanks also to Andrew and to Mayen uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of this. So I come really from theater background, theater, theater um, training. And uh, in, in 2009 or so, I sort of accidentally fell into working um, with computer programmers on stuff, and I, I ended up sort of calling what I was intending to do algorithmic theater. I say that because I, I made one piece, which I'll tell you about, and then I wrote a little essay um, about, you know, called algorithmic theater, and it was sort of more of like an aspirational document than really a description of anything I'd already done. And I have to say, in a lot of ways, it, it continues to be an aspirational document. I've made a lot of projects since then that get kind of called algorithmic theater, but I'm not sure I've really ever done it. Um, uh, but I'll say, I'll say more about what I mean. So the, the notion of algorithmic theater was intended uh, to make theater um, that was sort of how generated in an algorithmic way, using the sort of, that sort of procedural step-by-step um, -step process. It's super common in other fields, uh, in particular, I'm a big John Cage fanatic, and so I was sort of inspired um, by his work, um, but also in visual art and contemporary music, and even in dance, it's like a, not an uncommon way of approaching material, but it's not super common in theater. Um, in 2009, I was working on a project. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it exactly. I was looking into the debate from the early 70s between Noam Chomsky and Michel Foucault, um, which, you know, is um, 
a pretty interesting dialogue between the two of them, even if not a super successful conversation. Um, the two of them talk a lot about their differing views of the relationship between language and thought. Um, from Chomsky's perspective, he's sort of a neo-Platonic figure, so you know you think and you basically say what you think, and there can be misunderstandings and like that. But there's there's some kind of direct <laughs> relationship. Uh, and for um, Foucault's sort of post-structuralist view, there's all kinds of interference in that process, that we um, are spoken as much as we are speaking, that we reproduce um, thought as much as we produce it, uh, that we're imitators uh, as much as creators. Um, a friend suggested that I look at an essay from 1950, the sort of famous Alan Turing essay on computing machinery and intelligence, um, because it's a kind of a third perspective on this uh, that proposes that there could be an absolute disconnect between language and thought, that you could somehow create the illusion of thinking in a machine. Uh, that machine would produce language, and it would convince humans that the machine was thinking. So when I read this uh, as a kind of proposal of what AI might mean, I thought, oh, wow, it's theater. I mean, it's theater in a way pure. It's an illusion. It's about creating belief. It's about tricking an audience. Um, and I started to think about, you know, how much of acting is also a kind of imitation of being human um, uh, and how much actors are always somehow on the edge of being uh, fake humans, uh, too artificial. The relationship between actors, robots, and puppets is, you know, a sort of common connection to make. So I made this piece that was two chatbots uh, talking about the same topics that Foucault and Chomsky were talking about. And in the wake of that, actually, I, maybe I should play just like 30 seconds of it. I, of course, I don't have it queued up, but I can kind of keep talking while I, while I queue it and while I change over the laptop to my laptop, multitasking. Uh, and... Um, uh, in the wake of that, I tried to figure out like what I had really been interested in. And in a way, it was um, this notion of an algorithmic dramaturgy. Like, how does an algorithm sort of um, order and structure information? What kind of narratives are implied, maybe, by different algorithms? Uh, and so I kind of theorized this idea of algorithmic theater as opposed to, oh, wait, let me wait until I've got the video up. Exactly. Uh, uh, how are we going to find it, though? I'm not on the internet. You know what? Forget it. You can imagine. It's two laptops. They talk about stuff. Uh, uh, so in the wake of this, you know, I started to think, you know, sort of algorithmic theater um, uh, as opposed to multimedia theater performance, which sort of uses video screens or other technology to create effects or to create decor, or that might include like scenes uh, on video along with live action scenes. And I wanted to um, really insist on this notion of a kind of procedural structuring of text, and in fact that the, the algorithms could perform live, that they are the part of the computer that's active, that acts, and there's like this old, like really old-fashioned theater saying that you know, theater is action, right? And it's supposed to be how you get actors to not just, like, pretend to be sad, but to be, like, trying to do something and accomplish something. Uh, so I thought, well, if I could get, you know, computers sort of performing, um, that would, uh, I don't know, produce some interesting possibilities both for an audience relationship to work, but also in terms of theater history, how theater has thought about the human, how theater has thought about language and the role of language on stage, what language is supposed to do when it's performed. Um, and also uh, some kind of old questions for performance about liveness and the body and how time passes in performance, the notion of ephemerality and the notion that performance is sort of always in a process of disappearance. Uh, and I thought, well, algorithmic theater therefore maybe is like the opposite of that, it's somehow persistent and it is somehow immortal uh, and the language is not communicating anything about an inner state of the performer because there is no inner state of the performer. Uh, so it seemed to me sort of a, um, I don't know, a, a productive, fertile field for development. Um, I will show one little clip from a piece that I actually premiered here at On the Boards in 2013 uh, called 
uh, piece of work, which was my attempt to really do algorithmic theater uh, the way I said I was going to. Uh, and it's an algorithmic Hamlet. Uh, so we used the text of Hamlet as a data set uh, and used very simple algorithmic structures like Markov chains and some keyword search, I mean like really super, super simple things to uh, rewrite the text at every performance. And the text would be spoken by text-to-speech uh, uh, voices. And as the language was sort of going through the system, it would automatically control the lighting and the sound and the underscoring and the stage effects. So in a way, it's like a kind of literal Hamlet machine, like a sort of autonomous uh, Hamlet creating thingamajiggy. Um, so here's a little bit of the... Um, sort of our like Ophelia Mad scene. sign for some reason. Is it plugged in? Um, in the in the time since this project, uh, well, I guess we'll start. We'll talk about we'll talk about that coming up. Um, I'm not sure I have any vamping to do actually. <laughs> Bam, bam, bam. Yeah, maybe you just carry on. We'll, we'll circle back. You can jump back if yeah. we find that it's working. Do you want me to pick it up from here? Sure, I don't know what Scott's doing. It's a little distracting over there. Yeah. Technical difficulties. Yeah. The machines are on to us. Uh, well, I, I will vamp for a moment to say that in the beginning of this, I skipped over an important uh, statement, which is, uh, who am I and why am I here? Uh, so, uh, I, as Mayan said, I'm, I'm not just Mayan's friend, although th I think that's probably my greatest attribute. Um, <laughs> But I'm also the director of the Device Theater Initiative at The Public. And what that means, uh, the way I consider it, is that it's my charge to create research-based creative development opportunities for independent artists. Uh, and so my fascination, and what I'm so excited about in speaking with these two artists today, is to learn how research uh, guides their craft. What kinds of questions motivate them? How do they iterate? And I guess to that end, I'll, I'll throw a question now to either of you, well, maybe to James while, while you tinker, uh, which is how do you prototype? How do you take an initial experimental question and build small scale prototypes to test the limits of your ideas? Um, well, uh I think I, I guess you know, I guess one one thing that's that's maybe interesting about working with new media and AI and things like that nowadays, maybe compared to like ten years ago, for instance, is the number of platforms, the, the you know ready-made platforms that are out there uh, for us to do that with, and so the the kind of workflow 
um, that maybe an artist or um, you know or a producer or, or whoever would would kind of work through might be quite similar to that done by an engineer or a technologist. Um, it's accessible. Like maybe 10 years ago, I might have had to write a computer vision algorithm from scratch or, or work with an engineer to make that happen. But now I can just buy it from Amazon, you know. Uh, and I, as long as I have enough programming skills to be able to, to work with their existing platform, then I can make something uh, using that, which tends to be really powerful and maybe more interestingly uh, works with you know the systems, the same systems that that the you know the corporations are working with, that that, that we are engaging with in society all the time. So I yeah. kind of like working through that kind of workflow increasingly. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm so happy you brought that up and this idea of using the instruments of perhaps the very subject of your of your criticism or, or of your critical inquiry. Yeah. Um, because last night I was speaking with Jenny Balsabramanian, who you heard speak earlier, uh, and who is an artist that I work with at The Public. And Jenny, as I was sharing some of my thinking for today, they said, go back to Donna Haraway, go back to uh, the, the Cyborg Manifesto. Uh, and so I went back last night, uh, sitting in my hotel room, reading through it, and I highlighted something that really resonated for, in my mind, both of your projects which is, um, she says, the main trouble with cyborgs, uh, the sort of human technology configurations, uh, which in some ways is a really liberating figure, uh, of course, is that they're the illegitimate offspring of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, not to mention state socialism. So on one level, there is this problem of like, if I start to make these cyborgian creations, I, it is by design a product of the very thing that I'm trying to interrogate if not indict, but then there's hope. She says, but illegitimate offspring are often exceedingly unfaithful to their origins. Their fathers, after all, are inessential. And I, for a moment I went, ow, but then I thought, no, 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 she's right. So I love this idea that both of you are creating works uh, well, I won't say both of you. I, I don't. I I think that you're working with some co uh, commercial grade, consumer grade technologies, uh, and so to look at technology culture by using the tools of technology culture is creating this illegitimate offspring that is that is radical by its very nature. Um, so I just love that. Um, do, do you want to share some thoughts about how you iterate, how you prototype, or, or anything I said, or yeah, do you want to say mean, anything? It's, it's tough, actually, because working in, in, in theater, you don't have a chance really to test things out too much before you're kind of committed to doing them. Yeah. So I, my sense is like every project I've done, there's always this really terrifying moment when I've like had an idea, you know, I've conferred with some computer scientists about certain kinds of feasibility, and then I've like gone forth and promised a show, you know, that's going to premiere on a certain day. Uh, but I don't know whether the idea is going to be interesting or not. I don't know how it's going to develop. And, I, and, you know, assurances of feasibility aside, uh, there's always this thing about, like, is it even going to kind of work? Um, even though I work, you know, always with pretty simple, with pretty simple tools, um, there's always, like, a moment of panic towards the beginning of projects. Oh, yeah, even just playing a video on a laptop is, like, almost impossible sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, so, you know, we do a lot of, like, debugging and a lot of testing and a lot of the rehearsal process doesn't... Uh, or I guess it looks exactly like a regular rehearsal process if, like, in regular rehearsals, like, no one ever spoke to each other and everyone was, like, <laughs> like, just kind of, like, doing their own work. And then for half an hour at the end of the day, we're, like, okay, do you want to try to hook it up? You know? Uh, uh, but by that time, we're so far, you know, we're so, like, deep in the process uh, that, you know, there's a little bit of, like, a we're going to make something, you know, happen. Uh, and that's, I'm always very jealous of people working in sort of visual art field that you, you know, Somehow it seems like the the work flows. You often like know what you've got before you go around selling it to people. Sometimes I mean, uh, it, I think a lot of um, you know large scale installations or public artworks yeah, yeah. become quite theatrical in the same respect. And I you know I guess I'd also be curious to follow that up with the question of you know does it matter if it works or if it works exactly the way it's supposed to work? I mean, you mentioned like with theater uh, as as having this kind of interesting issue of fakeness and pretend. 
um, I wonder for myself and also, also, also having having seen a piece of work on the boards a few years ago, you know, the, the what are the signs that this thing does what it's supposed to be doing, you know, and, and how do we kind of author those things in order to give it a uh, performance of authenticity, a performance of like the algorithm actually working or, or, or something which shares a platform with with the thing that this references, you know? Yeah, it's interesting that, that when I was starting this kind of stuff, I was getting, a lot of people were like, well, does it, again, like, it doesn't really matter. Like, you should just script it and just pretend that it's the algorithm actually generating the text, you know? And then you can, like, be sure it'll be funny and stuff. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, I decided that, that uh, there would have to be some level of, like, trust or something or some, some level of me doing what I said I was doing. Uh, in order for the thing to be interesting, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and the notion of the actual mechanical Turk, like where the name comes from, right, is like yeah. from a chess. It was supposed to be an automated chess game, mm -hmm. uh, and it was you know amazing people at the county fairs that this automated chess player could actually win games. But there was really a guy, you know, in there moving the arms around. Um, so it's like the first example of like the fake robot. That, mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, so I always felt like it would be really just too much of a pity for me to do that. To yeah, it well, yeah. it's a good plan B, at least. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> if need be, right. Do you, uh, t to this point of, of um, sort of remaining true to your thesis, do you ever find yourself compelled to make the, the immaterial, the digital material so that you can make it legible to your audiences? That is to say, like, how do you make the algorithm or, or the operating mechanism, since so much of what you're painting with are, are immaterial tools? Um, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's, that's a good, um, good problem. Um, you know, I think about someone like uh, Simon Denny, for instance, making installations that deal with things like the blockchain and feeling like so the work has to include components which actually explain what the blockchain is before you can actually appreciate the work that he's done and so he kind of turns that round into into a, a kind of didactic work of some sort yeah. so I, I think there is that um, but at the same time I think fundamentally it's got to be a good experience you know I mean under the hood we could nerd out and say this thing's amazing you have no idea what's going on here but if the experience doesn't actually connect um, and often that has to be an emotional connection. And that's where I think, you know, working with the mechanical Turk workers, for instance, directly and making them visible and having that emotional connection come through, which it really did, was a good way to access problems and questions about AI and its relationship to, to people. Uh, so finding a, a system where you can explore that through the experience rather than necessarily through the technology, I think, yeah. is, is the way to go usually. Annie, how about you? Um, yeah, there. There's always a huge temptation to be didactic, you know, um, and I've re I don't like to do it actually um, because it, it it for me like the the um, the possibility of the emotional connection, like I hope, is increased when you're not when you're not asking the audience to um, uh, think too much about the construction. Like, one of the reasons why I like to work with really dumb algorithms is because I have a, a dream that the audience will start to understand how the thing works just by watching the show sure. unfold, um, or at least develop a fantasy of how it works, and that that would be kind of um, possibly sort of empowering and demystifying uh, in some way about technology that, for most of us, still makes us a little nervous. Mm -hmm. um, and also would... Um, create like a nice back and forth for the audience, like that they're moving in between um, following along like the content and the, and the sort of character level or like the story level to the extent there is story and the how it gets put together um, and that, that shift in how the audience is thinking would be like a source of pleasure, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I've tried to be like, you know, like, one of those, you know, cool artists who just like presents the thing, but then anyone who has questions about it, I'll stay afterwards you know, and <laughs> yeah. explain it all. Yeah. yeah, I mean, working with platforms also suggests these are things that people use themselves all the time. Yeah. So I think that helps as well if you identify technology that's not like 
over the horizon completely, but something that has currency. And then I think, I think there's, there's some expectation for your audience to understand what computer vision or face recognition might be, for instance, and what, what politics and meanings go alongside that, you know? Well, and it sounds to yeah. me almost like by using these readily available technologies or by using a dumb algorithm or a simple algorithm, you're allowing for the humanity or even just hearing you speak, Annie, it sounded like, God, could I watch the piece and start to see it as a character? Could I start to uh, try and understand it on a human emotional level yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you I made mean, it legible. So, so yeah, what I always try to stay away from is stuff that's like really gizmo-y, like, like whiz-bang where you feel like, like, wow, how'd they do that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the old thing about like the sufficiently advanced technology is a form of magic, um, which I guess is Arthur Schwartz, right? Uh, and, and Arthur Clarke. Uh, and, um, and, and so I try to avoid anything that seems like magical, you know, like... like uh, like cool, just where that can be the only response you can have. It's like cool, um, and uh, and and you know, there's a there's a visual artist who I was kind of influenced by, named Manfred Moore, who was like one of the first generation of uh, computer artists in the late '60s. And he um, wrote a little essay. He had the first like solo show of computer art in in the world, um, and he wrote a little essay about. Um, you know, always showing work like in multiples because then the viewer could understand the underlying rules uh, and that you would, um, y you know, so he, he liked this notion of sort of like, a, so, sort of a gesture towards a completism, like as though the parameters that he set, there's like a set of possible solutions, like a set of artworks that would fulfill the parameters uh, that he set. It's maybe in the hundreds of thousands, it could be in the billions, you know. Uh, and so he would show enough work side by side that you might be able to like, you could kind of like reverse engineer what the program was uh, by looking at a few of the examples. In theater, you can't do that, right? Because uh, you normally are seeing it on one night. But, but my work works the same way, that there's a sort of set of possible performances that could be generated from the rules. So I tried to be like simple enough in the construction always that, you wouldn't need to see five examples to figure out. Yeah. You would have an hour or an hour and 20 minutes with the thing, and you might be able to uh, approach it nonetheless. That's great. Mm. Um, so another sort of delightful moment I had last night as I was pouring through some of the things I could find online was um, when you either someone wrote or you wrote uh, about your piece, The Great Outdoors, this idea of new romanticism, mm. which gave me chills because I love Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, what a great way to look at our relationship to technology, to, to it as a, as a sort of metaphysical dread and delight all at once. And, it, and then like I happened to turn the page, and I was on a computer, so I didn't do this. Um, but, and, and James, I came to your uh, turn of phrase, which is uh, something to do with domesticating uh, surveillance. Mm -hmm. Right, do I have that right? So it sounds like something I might yeah. say. Yeah, sure. But the, the, the idea of trying to not just tame, but, but domesticate uh, the, the supernatural force that is contemporary technology got me really excited about your, the, short of, the shared space that you occupy in your creativity. Um, so do, first of all, do you find that that speaks to a larger creative project, or was I just picking you know, sort of cherry picking a little bit of, of your, your, some of your work. Um, well, I mean, The Great Outdoors is really kind of explicitly about the digital sublime um, and my sense of overwhelm, you know, it was like um, a piece I made uh, in 2006, late 16, 17. So uh, um, like a lot of us, I was, um, you know, terrified and not so delighted. Uh, but um, the, that sense of this sort of over, like this sort of scary, like kind of wilderness of the internet, the vast size of it, the ugliness of it, but still this possibility for discovery. You know, it, it seemed to suggest itself to me like a landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe in the same way, like those old, you know, sort of maps <clears throat> of, um, 
you know, when there was still parts of the earth left to be explored. And so there would be like regions that, uh, you know, were undefined or that were given funny names. Um, and, uh, and so, so, and then, you know, and then I was looking at like work by artists like Kenny Goldsmith and Hito Styrel and um, some writing by Sean Nagai in particular who writes about uh, a kind of sublime that's like dumb and like not elevating like the 19th century or 18th century romantic sublime, that there's a kind of sublime that's about being overwhelmed by shit and, um, and like almost beaten into submission, like your cognition is sort of pulverized by the amount of crap. Yeah. Um, and I thought, aha, now that I understand. <laughs> that <is my laughs> I, know something, I get something about that. Um, so that was sort of what the notion of making a piece about the internet um, you know, was about. So Great Outdoors is a piece that uses... Um, uh, internet comments as a corpus, and uh, we arrange, we sort of sample, lightly sample internet comments from Reddit and a few other sites. Um, every 24 hours, we collect about a million and a half um, comments uh, from like 400 subreddits and two other little, I mean, it's really this tiny little corner of the internet that we're taking from, and it's just this overwhelming amount of material. And then we use a, a kind of model of um, information entropy, the, Sh the Claude Shannon equation uh, about information density, to um, create a little script from those comments that a performer reads inside an inflatable planetarium, which is why there's no video of that one, because the planetarium doesn't video well. Uh, but that's what that piece is about. It's about like the great outdoors. It's called the great outdoors. So it's about the, what is out there, and what's in here, and what's in here, and the relationship between inner and outer uh, in that way. And James, I think the when I quoted you or misquoted you about domesticating surveillance, it was maybe uh, with the piece Panopticon Panorama. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess my my um, my attitude towards surveillance over over the last few years uh, in, in the works I've made, I've made a number of works that I guess involve computer vision and facial profiling and, and that kind of thing. And I, I suppose, you know, thinking about it in relation to the internet in particular, there, there's definitely, you know, the thought in my mind that um, that we, it's, it's more of a, a kind of symptom of who we are. It involves a lot of, um, you know, self-measurement, um, self-surveillance, uh, it's not necessarily, I mean, like historically, you think about surveillance art, you think about, you know, uh, a very kind of black and white kind of situation. Uh, surveillance is bad. Uh, we're going to make some work where we break the cameras or, or resist. Uh, whereas, you know, my experience of making works that, that involve um, face profiling and narrative and so on is that people really want to be seen. They want to be included in some way. Uh, and they, you know, that somehow reflects perhaps on the, the domestication of surveillance in, in some level. Um, there's also, I, I like the idea of, of the digital sublime, the, the volume problem, you know. Um, and I think, you know, we think about big data methods increasingly be finding their way into some of these, these works or so in terms of how we, how we find patterns. Um, how we how we go about composing them methodologically rather than doing things manually increasingly looking for algorithms to do, th do these things for us um, so yeah well and it seems like you've found ways to restore the intimacy to the conversation in your mechanical Turk piece having people of their own accord decide to do these really personal bedroom videos yeah yeah yeah, yeah I mean I think intimacy definitely comes into it and the kind of uh, conflation of visibility with meaning, you know, or meaningfulness. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you're not seen, then you're nothing. Like, uh, in the logic of, of Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, it's, uh, it's all, all views, you know. It's all about being visible. Yeah. Like, this is the big nightmare now. It's like our, our, our desire for meaning, our desire for communication, our desire for intimacy. It's like that's exactly what's being hijacked and stolen from us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's true, and um, it's you know it's interesting where AI kind of comes into that in, in terms of determining who's seen, how they're seen, 
And there's a tendency to flatten things out, which is, is very problematic, um, to impose narratives upon people based on you know, demographics or based on habits and so on. And so maybe to some extent, you know, the role of, of artworks that use those things is to, is to irritate that, to upset that uh, somehow too. Yeah. Um, well, I want to leave a moment in case any of you have any questions for our panelists. Um, anything at all? Let me see if I can see you. All right. Um, uh, do you have any questions for each other now that you've come to know each other's work? You don't have to. I just wanted to give you an opportunity. Um, I, as you were talking about this idea of algorithms and, uh, and sort of uh, visibility, who gets represented and who gets lifted up through all these different social services uh, or social networks, um, I'm reminded of, did either of you read a book called, I love the title so much, Weapons of Math Destruction? <laughs> Jenny just nodded, yeah. Uh, Kathy O'Neill. Um, uh, so she, she just talks about the ways that operational models have blind spots that reflect the judgments and priorities of their creators and how they're uh, regularly erased. Uh, the, the, the creators are erased so that we never go back and interrogate the underlying uh, biases uh, um, uh, and, and systems of, of exploitation or racism or sexism or uh, any sort of dismissal that are baked into these algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, what I took from you is that uh, rather than dismissing outright any of these systems of surveillance to start to interrogate how they work and how we enable. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part, I, I think it, it's worth considering Microsoft's Tay robot in, in relation to that, for instance, um, because, you know, on, on the one hand, they wanted to make a, a chatbot that could, um, you know, learn from a community of people. But the question is, what if that community of people, i.e. us, are racist and sexist and have all these kinds of, um, you know, uh, problematic human properties. Mm -hmm. um, sh is, is, should Microsoft be in the business of, of deleting those things and, you know, sanitizing uh, the chatbot? Um, uh, you know, there, what you might end up with in, in that instance would be a system which was, you know, very um, homogenous. And, you know, in terms of the relationship between the human and AI, a human and machine, these are uh, these these things i'm not saying you know racism is the important thing that defines human beings but things which uh maybe aren't intuitive to a machine are things that we want to try and find a balance and preserve mm -hmm. you know uh, i think uh, chantal Mouf said uh you know a healthy democracy is an unruly one it's not where everybody agrees with each other it's not sure. one of consensus and so you don't want uh, an ai system where everybody is in consensus where everybody's agreeing with each other. You want that healthy conversation to, to exist somehow. Yeah. And so the question is, how do you, how do you uh, allow technology to, to let that through, let the, the human through, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I was just thinking as you, as you were speaking, you know, that, that in some ways it's so much worse than bias, right? Because it's um, the, the notion, the, the, the notion of big data is that the patterns are emergent, right? They're not controlled by anyone. They're not edited. They're 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 revealing truths as opposed to producing truths, um, as though there's some truth about you know people and demographics that's sort of already out there waiting to be discovered in the numbers. Um, and, and as Kathy O'Neill and Sophia Noble and um, Antoinette Rudois and many others have written, like there's always a production because the, the, the way that you know, data analysis works is that there's a lot of preparation of data. Yeah. There's a lot of human judgment and labor that goes into the, to organizing the systems that then will seem to sort of produce these objective patterns. Um, and and we're we're so much uh, in, we're so increasingly at the mercy of those uh, systems and their judgments. 
Mm. But there's there's almost no way to sort of trace back to the to the decisions that were how the decisions were first made that produced those results, you know. Um, and it's not only that like we can't; it's like the the you know CTOs of Google can't either because right. the systems are so complex, uh, and the sort of categories of analysis are um, also automated, um, so they're not fixed static things that you can go back and say, oh, those categories were a little off and we better adjust them. You know, the categories are being invented also by the algorithmic systems. Um, so there's sort of this dynamic, ever-changing um, uh, world uh, that we have almost no access to and that uh, we're giving increasing um, power to to determine all kinds of things. So, yeah, in some ways, like, the... The chatbot that says, like, I hate feminists is, like, the least of the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on that terrifying note, uh, <laughs> I would love it if you would all join me in thanking these wonderful artists for taking the time here today. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, Miss Mayan Wong, my, my dear, dear friend. Thank you, the director of the Device Theater Initiative at the Public Theater. <laughs> Um, thank you, Andrew, and thank, thank you again to Annie and James. Uh, we'll have you uh, settle back into your seats. I'm going to invite uh, Daphina McMillan and Susie Lee back to that stage as we sort of set up, talk amongst yourselves. Um, to uh, Hi, welcome back. It's, it's uh, nice to have you here. So I have here um, Daphina McMillan and Susie Lee, and uh, I wanted to just start off with uh, asking you all to start off a question about your, the word that I've been sort of thinking about is sort of like multi-directional and multi-dimensional, and I think that both of you have had such rich and um, multi-directional career paths in a way, right? And I would love for uh, each of you to just take, you know, minutes, five minutes, however long you need to, um, to talk about your career and even personal path to here and the pivot points in which you sort of like, what I view as pivots in what you've been doing in terms of a career um, and, and the sort of questions you were asking yourself um, at that point when you were making a particular pivot. So um, maybe we start off with you. How's everybody doing? Good. Oh, good. I'm Dayfina. It's lovely to be here in Seattle. I just moved to Albuquerque about a year and a half ago, which was a pivot point. Um, and so it's, it's, I love being in the desert. And also, it's just wonderful to see so much greenery and <laughs> lushness in life. Um, my journey in five minutes or less. Um, I'm originally from Houston. Um, my background has been primarily in arts management. I was a theater drama club geek growing up. I love theater, dance, choir, and I realized early on that I wasn't very good. Um, and so I feel like I've been on this pathway since undergrad to figure out how can I support artists how can I um, raise visibility for amazing work, amplify work, without actually having to be on stage? Um, so my, my original, my first stint in New York City, I was doing a lot of corporate communications work, working um, at a large global PR agency, working with financial services clients. And um, again, I'm from Texas, and I moved to New York so I could be closer to a theater and Broadway, and I fell in love with all of that. So on the side, and I'm, while I was, you know, pitching uh, PR stuff for, you know, MetLife and ING and annuities, I was working with my friends who had off-off Broadway gigs or a friend of mine who started a comedy company. I was always finding a way to sort of be involved in the work. And I had a point where I said, um, hmm, this is not why you came to New York. Um, and how do you really immerse yourself in arts more full-time? And so that led me on a journey to work part-time at this PR agency and also working at the Brooklyn Center for the Performing Arts doing marketing and realized that wasn't sustainable because while I was at this amazing job trying to support with brochures and doing all this work, my clients were still calling me like, hey, what's up? So 
That led me to DC, um, another pivot point. Um, I was accepted into an international arts management program at the Kennedy Center, and I think that was my, that was my most significant pivot. Um, it was the first time I was able to really work full-time in the arts um, and to see um, an organization like the Kennedy Center and all the resources was, I was like just in my own little playground. It was amazing. And one of the things that happened there was I was um, company manager for a series of August Wilson plays that we produced. We produced all 10 of his plays and brought in about 60 artists from all over the country to do all 10 in rep. Um, and I was the lowly company manager, like booking flights. Um, but that's where I met uh, an amazing director and founder of Penumbra Theater Company in, twin, in the Twin Cities. And uh, I remember a call with Lou Bellamy where it was like January and I was booking his flight, of course, because that's what a good company manager does. And he was like, you know, it's like 70 degrees in Minnesota right now. And I was like the hell is this guy talking about? Um, it's not. And uh, it's cold. Uh, but I leaned into a position that was created there. Um, Penumbra is a black theater company in St. Paul, Minnesota, founded out of the black arts movement. And that juxtaposition for me is important to note because I left the Kennedy Center with a plethora of resources and then went to Penumbra, where August Wilson actually wrote his first play. He was a poet before then, um, based in a community center, really about doing work about, by, for um, African Americans. Um, and realized from that experience, um, it was cold. Uh, again, I'm from Texas. Was, come, come back to see with me. Um, I stayed two winters, but for me that experience was really eye-opening because I saw amazing work being created without the resources needed to do the work. So that's a thread. Um, I'll speed this up. Um, I went back to New York and started working for Theater Communications Group, TCG, which is the National Service Organization for Nonprofit Theater, and wore many hats, um, including director of communications, running all of our internal external relations work, um, convening, producing all of our conferences. We had a thousand people at a, a city every year doing conferences and then leaned into our equity and inclusion work. Um, the American theater field is really, and still is, I'm sort of feeling like I'm out of it, so I'm talking in past tense, but um, really eager to say how do we, um, how are we more inclusive? Um, how can we make our work more diverse and not just the work, but our board, our staff, so I started many initiatives to help try to um, interrogate that question. And again, I was holding Penumbra in my heart the whole time. And again, seeing um, a lot of well-resourced institutions now leaning to this work and then smaller institutions, usually led by people of color and communities of color like Penumbra, um, still not getting the resources they, I would say, deserved um, in this sort of interesting mix of how do we think about diversity. That led me to leaning into philanthropy because I'm like, I can go into philanthropy and figure this out. Um, and that was interesting. I worked for Mike Bloomberg's foundation um, in the arts program and managed two large uh, portfolios. One, a digital art program to support primarily museums, think about how to interrogate and use technology in their spaces. Um, and then also a program for small and mid-sized organizations in six different cities, which was like a 200 $50 million program. Um, so all that to say, sorry, did I say that? 250 organizations, it was a $35 million program. That was another big pivot for me because I was excited about that position because we could sort of interrogate who gets funding and why. Um, and again, I wanted to help the penumbers of the world, and I realized that it was a little bit um, more insidious than I thought. And that led me to leave New York um, to start my own company, which is called Crux, which is looking at this intersection of supporting black artists in particular, tell stories um, in immersive technology spaces, so AR, VR, XR, MR, whatever we're calling it today. Um, and I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, easier to bootstrap a company, not in New York City. Um, and I'm also doing consulting work with the city of Albuquerque, supporting a new program to support artists there, an amazing artistic community in New Mexico, um, and a lot of other consulting, but that's where I am. Great, thank you. Susie? Uh, <laughs> you say multi-directional. Um, I think my parents would say it's a career whiplash is what I have, um, <laughs> frustratingly for them. Um, I actually started out in the medicine medical school path and uh, right around the end of college decided that that wasn't really for me. Um, they were really, really, really disappointed and have actually recently asked, why did we pay that much for your college tuition? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, um, I made a pivot actually to education and uh, public education, and so I taught in the um, public schools in New York City. Um, from there, I, I think that I started to begin to question, um, whenever you enter a system, you suddenly realize if you're kind of an idealistic person, you run pretty quickly into the disappointments of what those systems are. Um, and at the time, I just felt like, you know, public school was, it was inertial, it was, it was racist, it was, um, um, it was really deeply problematic, and as one person, I couldn't really feel like I could do anything to change it. So I think my biggest pivot was actually then to really reconsider what I wanted to do and decided to go to art school. Um, my partner at the time was like, you're driving me crazy. Why don't you take a ceramics class? And I was like, no, because you told me. Um, and then I had a friend who was like, hey, you want to take a ceramics class? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a great <laughs> idea. So um, I think from that, you know, what I, what I look back on it and realize is when you work with clay, it's like the first time I think that I felt like this was something that was fresh and untouched and suddenly the thing that I was thinking about or wanting to make, I could make it and it was really up to me. And so I think from that seed, it felt like what I really wanted to do was always kind of will things into existence that I felt like needed to happen. Um, and it doesn't happen all the time, right? I mean, the first box that I made out of clay was awful and not at all with the thing that I wanted to, to, to make, but you realize, like, you can get to that point. So um, I think that's kind of one trajectory is, is how I got into kind of the art-making space. And then from there, I realized, you know, you to, to be an artist and to be kind of an acknowledged artist, you were supposed to, like, go into the gallery scene and you were supposed to, you know, go to these art fairs. And um, I did that and then realized I really was disillusioned by the inequity in that system and also just the really gross socioeconomics of the 1% of the 1%. And so when I started to ask myself, well, who was I making art for? It certainly wasn't for that person buying the work. Um, and so that kind of system to me was problematic, and I thought about how could I make work um, that still had an impact but subverted that kind of system. And so um, I was single at the time, and uh, but I was like, ah, how do you meet people when you're not sleeping with them in grad school? I don't understand. <laughs> and we were all like, you need to use these dating apps. And I was like, oh, this is a terrible idea. These are awful. Um, and, uh, and so when I was looking at them, I thought, I can do this better. Um, and I know how to do this better because at the time, a lot of the work that I was doing in terms of art making was now migrating from ceramics and very um, you know, materially based uh, mediums to technology and thinking of technology though as a sculpture that could be shaped through time and I think that one of the things that you know maybe we're talking about as a larger theme is how much in human intervention happens and at what point point. Um, and a lot of times I think what's been frustrating about the human intervention it's either too late or it's because there's something of the machine that has failed and what we forgot to do is to think about ourselves as um, the vigilance that has to happen at very intentional times um, and that we still have that power to do it. Um, so I was like, I think I can make a totally different and better dating app that actually still has a very fundamental um, human quality. Um, when we launched it, it was called Siren, um, we were immediately labeled as a feminist dating app because it was human and it wasn't about like, you know, mass marketing and Amazon shopping for people. Um, so we were like, Sure, cool, we're feminists, that's fine. Um, but the idea was that um, you could actually tell the story of your personality over time, that it wasn't about this little blurb and a photo and that you would make these snap judgments, but we had these daily questions that we had from the creative community and every single day there was a totally different question. And as you answer those questions, that's what actually started to populate your profile and also begin to start conversations. So there was this part of technology which was, yes, you can break out of your social circle of the grocery store or the neighborhood block that you're in to meet people that you could actually you know, cross these physical boundaries or these socioeconomic boundaries to find somebody, but that ultimately the thing that we needed and that the machines could never do correctly was find that human chemistry. And that was something that the humans had to do better than anyone else, that a machine couldn't create, you know, you, you couldn't have a Markov chain that would create a better question than a really amazing author. Um, and that's, that was a belief that I, I, I had to the very end. So um, 
Uh, that was a startup that I ended up running um, and then ran into the system of like, oh, yucky misogyny and racism in the startup world and venture capital, that's bleh. Um, so we ran out of money and, uh, um, and then I thought I had an ulcer, but it wasn't, it was actually a kid. So, <laughs> uh, I was like, you should do that pregnancy test again. I don't think it's right. <laughs> uh, technology was right, though, and I was wrong. And um, I now have a 19-month-old. Um, and I think about her a lot when I think about technology and especially about ML and AI because uh, I find now that she has surpassed her intelligence has surpassed a lot of what we think of as like artificial intelligence. And so I think, I'm not sure AI is actually the best phrase to use for the things that computers and, and, and systems can do right now. I think it's like, there's things that they can do. I'm not sure I would call it intelligence because the things that she can do right now far surpasses what they can do and she's only gonna get better at it. Um, and uh, and I, I had PTSD over like the startup world, but then um, one of our in, uh, investors uh, who actually worked at Microsoft and had founded Cortana and was really interested in machine learning in terms of how to amplify storytelling. And he said, I don't believe that technologists can do it by themselves. We do need to have a creative voice and we need to have, uh, we need to have an inclusive and diverse voice into this into the very origins of this company, will you join as a co-founder? And I was like, you're getting the money, right? White male from Microsoft? And he said, yes, and I was like, great, I will join. <laughs> um, and so now I'm uh, co-founding a startup that is trying to use um, ML and AI to try to unlock the content that's in your head to be able to help you tell stories. Um, and the reason that I feel like for me it's really important that this kind of work happens is not because I feel like LinkedIn needs another way for you to tell your bio, even though that's a great business model for that. I think it's actually that the internet right now, when you look at the kinds of content and stories that are out there, are ex it's extremely homogenous. And, you know, even when I want to look up... Um, when I was, you know, when the kid was like four months old and I was like, I don't know why you're crying and I would look something up, all I would find was extremely narrow, uh, like parents magazine information about how to raise a four month old and some part of me was like, I am Korean and I don't believe that's the way I want to raise this moment of this child's life and I could not find anywhere that was English speaking something that resonated with who I was and what I wanted to be as a parent. And I felt like that happened over and over again with many, many things that were happening that even though we Google something, it ends up being a very, very, very narrow snippet of what the breadth of content there is out there. And so for me, creating something that makes it easier for people to tell stories and to really say, everyone has a story to tell and that it is actually worth telling is why I think something like this should happen. So that's where I am. Great, thank you. So you can see perhaps now why I paired uh, these two speakers together is that I feel like their work is really at the intersection of arts, technology, how to be more inclusive, how to have more equity within sort of the, the, the voices and the stories and the, the information and the cultures and, and voices that are represented in the digital space, in the storytelling space, in, in sort of in real life, for example. And so, and that brings me to, you know, my background is in theater, so for better or worse, it's grounded in storytelling, you know. Um, I spend a lot of my career trying to fight that. Is is really I'm like it's more about form, you know. It's like the form can, can the form actually can um, uh, uh, be the content itself. For example, like those were the things that I was asking. So um, I was wondering, you know, there's so much uh, things that are out there about um, how to um, tell stories. Uh, and uh, yesterday we were at, at the top act from Heisenberg and uh, Sarah Tuttle, the astrophysicist, was talking about um, how to be better storytellers about the science, how to be better storytellers about, about sort of like the vast information that is out there in astronomy, in, in data, in, in, in what is out there that is a long, sort of like beyond our comprehension sometimes and is the job of storytellers to sort of 
either not whittle it, but distill it, focus it, so that we can sort of look at the same thing together at the same time and have a conversation about it. Can you talk about sort of um, the uh, where you where you situate yourself in sort of like the the role of storytelling and, and narrative in the world, um, whether it's whether you're creating frameworks in which people can tell stories and what you're doing with that, and especially with Crux, or for the app that you're talking about and that storytelling app, like just a little bit, where you situate yourself in sort of this concept of storytelling and narrative, because what, you know, the title of it really is sort of like, how do we determine the future of, of the stories we tell ourselves as, as, as a people, as a human, of humanity, for example, so. Um, I think that when business sort of takes over storytelling, it becomes bastardized, and so suddenly we get really confused that marketing and stories and promotion and PR, they all become something that's called content creation. Um, and when I, I think those things are a little bit different. And so when I think about what a marketer would do in terms of a certain kind of content and how they would tell a story versus how an artist would, I think you come to very different kinds of stories. Um, and I think we have to pause there for a second because that's one of those moments where if we let the machines and the business kind of do what they do, suddenly we lose a certain kind of... I don't know, some of that quality of storytelling that I think uh, is really deeply empathetic and really, really human, and we let the machines kind of do their thing, and we let the algorithms do their thing, and then we suddenly are like, that's not the story that I want to tell. Um, I think that when we even look at like uh, dating app profiles, it's not really your story, right? It's actually a marketing blurb. Um, but but that's kind of what we sort of conflate now in our head. Um, so I think that one of the roles that, uh, that I'm starting to look at in terms of this, what this software wants to do is really to say, what are the qualities of the stories that people want to hear and listen to? And they aren't these marketing pitches. Um, I, I don't think I know the answer at this point in time, um, but I think that's, that's one of those moments where I'm like, let's pause before we actually just kind of let this thing do its thing. Um, I was just with Kamal Sinclair. Do you know Kamal? She used to be at Sundance, and she, um, I'm probably going to butcher her quote, but I think she said, imagination informs innovation, and I think there's something in that, that for me, storytelling by nature is imagination. It's birthing something. <laughs> it wasn't an ulcer <laughs> um, that didn't exist before, and for me with Crux, I mean, I didn't enter Crux into really just being excited about AR and VR. My co-founder was really into it and was seeing a lot from her perspective um, in the arts world as, as well. And we were seeing the same inequities as far as um, a new emerging form of storytelling and seeing um, predominantly white men getting a lot of funding. I think at that point it was like $500 million going to like two or three main sort of VR companies. Um, and we were seeing artists of color, women of color, um, Hyphen Labs, this one piece in particular, neurospeculative Afrofeminism was getting a lot of play and a lot of visibility, and yet they were totally like eating ramen noodles in New York, you know, and sort of the same kind of who's telling the stories, who's getting funding for the stories, who's getting the resources, who's getting um, the ability to take risk, who's being seen as the risk. Um, for me is really interesting. Like, it's a risk to work with you, but for you, oh, you know, you're going to fail and it's okay. And so for me, given that my background is in theater as well, I feel like there's an opportunity to tell a lot um, better stories, especially in VR. There's a lot of crap out there, <laughs> a lot of violent stuff out there, porn. I mean, there's just shoot 'em up games, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, we have the opportunity to dream and work with, I think, multidisciplinary artists, like that's the opportunity for me. It's really being led out of the film world because that's where a lot of the equipment is, et cetera. But I'm really excited about building Crux because we're, one, looking to sort of white label the distribution platform and marketing and marketing co market content, quality content by black creators. But the other piece is um, over the past years, we've had over like 200 conversations with folks and a lot of the artists that we know were saying, we really want to play in this medium and tell stories and it sounds really awesome, but we don't know where to start or we don't have the, the resources to do it. Um, and so for me, I think, you know, a friend of mine said, like, we've got to find the prince, like Prince, you know, the artist formerly known as, 
of the space. Like, who's really going to, like, turn, like, scratch the turntables? And we know usually black people are really innovative, and black Twitter became hot because, you know, Twitter became hot because of black. But we usually don't ever get, um, follow me here. I think we usually get used to make things really exciting. Um, work gets co-opted. We don't really have our own spaces and benefit from the sizzleness of the thing that we've remixed. Um, and so for me, I'm excited about looking in this space and bringing in architects, choreographers, dancers, theater makers to really figure out what, what story looks like in this space when everything is changed. It's not this 2D thing. So I'm excited about creating content with black folks um, and all different types of art making, visual artists, et cetera, and really... This summer, we're going to start doing a series of design sessions. We're thinking about creating um, a game. Um, that would be our first piece of content. So, uh, And the other piece I would add in thinking about storytelling is, you know, people were really excited when Black Panther came out. and like, oh, my God, Black Panther made a lot of money. And I sort of said, yeah, a lot of us were saying Disney made a lot of money, you know. So, again, it's like um, I think we're getting beyond, or I personally am getting beyond this, like, representation conversation. I'm really excited to think about ownership as well. Um, I was looking up uh, some statistics, and this was from Ford. Uh, this is not necessary just in the VR space, but it says from 2018, this is from 2018, the percentage of venture capital f funding going to startups with at least one woman founder has stayed at 10% since 2016. 2.2% um, um, is the percentage of venture capital going to all female founding teams or started with a solo female founder. Um, and uh, in 2018, it was like 100 billion in funding, right? And then for women of color, 0.0006% of the 420.7 billion in total tech venture has been raised since 2009. So that's sort of like, it was just sort of like, the amount of money is so staggering and, and the disparity is even more staggering. Um, and then this was from Forbes also. Interestingly, hundreds of millions of dollars is being spent on diversity and inclusion initiatives by major tech companies to recruit more tech employees, but very little of it is being spent on mergers and acquisitions and VC arms. So it's, it's I mean, this is not just in the tech and startup space. This is in the theater space. There is this idea of the performance of equity, the performance of inclusion, and this idea of representation and just sort of like just a visual representation of like, look, you have Black Panther, look, you have all these amazing artists of color there on stage, but who is getting the ownership? Who is getting funding? Who is getting sort of the, the keys to the car to drive faster and, 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 and further? You know, that's, that's the question, right? And right before this, Dafino was like, so what, what are we focusing on? And I've been sort of like thinking through, because Dafino always asks me like <laughs> the hard questions. Um, the question is, as I'm going through the, this, um, this, this day and going through sort of thinking about my fellowship and, and, and where I am in the world, I also have a young child, right? And, and so th this question of like, what is the reality that we're creating now? How many, um, you know, Annie was saying like, how many like le um, uh, uh, levels and, and layers of reality and how can we make reality complex and, and, and diverse and beautiful and they're very, various different perspectives, that's the thing that I've been sort of like circling around of how can we in the arts world, we in, you know, the, not POC world, but, but artists of color and people of color really sort of forge space mm -hmm. for those stories so that we have a multi-level, multi-directional, multi-dimensional idea of like who we are in the world, right? Um, uh, the one of the, one of the things is, um, one of the, uh, things I was writing as I, I was preparing for this is, you know, there's a lot of talk about sort of giving people voice, right? Which, you know, is kind of crazy because everybody already talks, everybody has a voice. It's how to tune, tune it to the right channel, right? So it's not the dominant channels, it's not just NPR, although we love NPR. You know, how do you find, how do you find the other stations and to make sure that, and to make sure that that is available and we're not taking away airspace from that, right? So how do we tune it to the right channel? What are, what, what are you doing to tune it to the channel that maybe you want to? Maybe it's not the right channel. Or the channel. And maybe that's part of interrogating that, how do we just make sure there are multiple voices? Mm -hmm. 
And maybe everybody, did everybody already know this? I feel like I just learned this, is that um, texting was invented first as a tool for folks that are deaf. Did people know that already? Did people know that? So to me, that's an example of like designing for the margins, like mm -hmm. something that was designed for those maybe without the most agency actually benefits its all. So I think if we kind of rethink, yeah. write and rethink, um, uh, yeah, who we've sort of centered um, is a question that I've been asking, for sure. Susie. Have a comment? I forget what it is. <laughs> I was talking halfway through, and I was like, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> Just in terms... Um, well, I think I, I, I sort of was, was, was still lingering on, like, you know, the co-opting of, of the narratives. Um, and I think that's really deeply problematic, right? That it happens at every level, right? That, you know, like right now, the restaurant industry is kind of the one that's sort of like in the eye of the storm in terms of like co-opting, you know, different traditions of like different grandmothers, da 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 da, -da. Um, Which is sort of interesting because at least in visual art, there is or there used to be maybe before the advent uh, or the, um, you know, before Instagram, this idea of provenance, right? That there was a way to track and... Uh, like the the story of an artwork throughout the ownership of who owned it at what point in time, and without that provenance, you were like, ah, I can't I can't take this from you because I don't actually know if this is legit. Um, and I, I just kind of wonder if there's something that we could do in some ways that there it, there could actually even be like a digital stamp, right? That says we have to look at the archives in which this information has been passed around and see who who put their stamp on this. Um, and is it a woman, right? Is it a person of color? Is it da 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 da? Is it this group of people? Um, and then be able to start to shape those narratives in that way, because I think what ends up happening, no matter what, is the loudest uh, dominant voice still wins in the end, and suddenly we forget about everything else that happened in the past. Do you, just going back to what you were saying, is that in the digital realm in terms? I in don't know. Stem, like uh, they don't internet. have anything like that. There's nothing no. in the system like that, right? It's like everything is about the new, new, new. But I'm just thinking kind of just, just spitballing about how it. How do right. you sort of trace back yes. the origin of uh, the original remix and how, how right. you know, it didn't start with Elvis Presley. It's, you know, it's sort of like... What? <laughs> 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 Sorry, no, start with, def, nothing started with Elvis Presley. Um, uh, at this point... <laughs> Can I give an example, though? The an early example that you need some water. Thank you. Um, an early example that really inspired us with Crux to think about revenue um, opportunity, and we are also um, in the process of forming a cooperative, which I can talk about more if we want to. Going back to ownership and sort of democratizing power and voting and all that, um, and sort of centering narratives. We, you know, and being in New Mexico, I'm doing a lot of learning and listening. Um, you know, thinking and um, trying to figure out how I can be an ally, I don't always love that word, with Native Indigenous folks, um, especially there's, in Albuquerque, it's I, the largest population of Native Americans in, than any other city. It's like 10%, which is huge. Um, but in thinking about centering voices, um, a project we learned about early on was a project developed by the Inlet, sorry, Cook Inlet Tribal Council in Alaska, which represents Native Alaskan tribes um, in the southern, south central part of Alaska. And one year, the council had a surplus, so they decided to use that money to actually create a game. It's a beautiful game. You should pull out your phone and download it now. It's called Never Alone. Um, and the impulse was to create a story about um, one tribe in particular. Um, the first year it came out, it was, you know, rated like number one in the app store, um, being spotlight everywhere. And um, the first year, I believe it made $17 million this game. And so they used that money to then um, get a stake in the gaming company and also to use that surplus back to the tribe. And so using it for like universal basic income and education. And so year over year, now they've got a stake, an equity stake in the gaming company. They're just, that money's coming. So that was a story we used to talk, um, we used to share because I think for me, the storytelling pieces, I love theater, I love live performance, but with these new tools and you thinking about technology, we have a lot more ways to think about income. And we know, we've talked about like sort of the 501c3 nonprofit model and theater, there's only so many seats and da da da. We were talking to 
of like arts organizations saying, you know, maybe you don't know what AR, VR, gaming, or any of the stuff is, but can you at least think about it from a revenue perspective? Um, we are storytellers. Let's create our own freaking game, you know? Um, and that money can go into any of the art that we want to do and sort of uplifting our own community. So just to center sort of native voices in this conversation, one, and then two, our, our interest with Crux is thinking about these new technologies as um, income opportunities and capital revenue opportunities to feed sort of this larger ecosystem of art making, especially with theater that's going through a lot of challenge with thinking about how to keep doors open and how to make the business model sustainable. That's even more problematic for institutions of color that um, haven't had those resources. So again, connecting my dots, how do these new technologies really support the ecosystem of art making? Um, Right, because in our Skype conversation, we were talking about why are we still using the old tools when we're in such a completely different sort of world yeah. uh, in terms of technology and media and connection and, and storytelling. Yeah. And, um, and, that's, and that's sort of because theater, it's so rooted in, in, in these institutions and, and, and bias and all of those things that it feels like what Crux is, is really poised to do is to really really put a stake down you know in in terms of in terms of that that world I mean uh, when I first moved west uh, I was a advisor panelist for the Sundance New Frontiers um, residency um, and it was a place for the XR VR AR space this was three years ago so it's you know things have moved really fast and I remember coming in and there were a lot of film people who were the experts in VR. They had the equipment, they knew what film was, but literally they were going, yeah, we need to figure out how to put people in 3D space. And I was like, we I'm in theater. Yeah, exactly. we, are, we are in 3D space, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so this idea, that, so it's, and it was funny, and, and my sort of um, real impulse right then was, oh, theater people need to get in on this. Theater people have the expertise, we have, we have the history, we, ha we have the expertise, we have the tools, we have the storytelling thing to really impact it at the point. Like, how do we take a pause and really be vigilant and, and, ha and not let it be about the porn and, and the violence and the, and the whatnot and really create these, I mean, and really be part of these amazing tools that could mm -hmm. tell new stories and, and determine the future and the path mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of what could be, right? Um, Thinking about what could be. Do you want to talk about Thingiverse? Oh, straight, totally on the opposite. Straight end. opposite. But I think. It, <laughs> but this is. I mean, going back to this idea of like the the reality and, and creating our own reality and creating our own future. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the other thing that I wanted to do was um, completely when I I had this kid, I was like, I didn't want to have a kid. I have a kid now. I and and so one of the stories that people tell about being a mother or being an artist mother and how do you balance your creative life with your domestic life and da 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 and there's all these problematic words about things and I, it just really just chafed me, right? Like I, I feel like um, I feel like part of the reason that we need more stories is because you look at all the stories out there and you're like, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, right? Like, and so you, you, you need to find more stories. Um, so, uh, so I knew that in order to to figure out how to do this, I needed to actually bring this, this this small human into the forefront of what I was doing and not just go, ah, I am an artist here, and then when you're not looking, I'm an, also a mother, right? Like, that's that felt really problematic as a, as a statement um, or as a thesis. So, um, so for her first birthday, instead of doing, like, cupcakes and beer, I was like, let me take my theater and performance folks and actually ask them to create a performance specifically for this age group. Um, and, uh, and one of the founders, one of my other friends, had actually sort of done this in China, and so she was super excited about doing this here. Nothing like this had happened in Seattle, and it wasn't like children's theater, and it wasn't like Barney. Um, this idea wasn't that you were supposed to educate or distract the child, but that there was something about the artistic experience that any age is entitled to have. And so um, uh, there's kind of an, a side note, which is there's a United Nations a Convention of Children's Rights, um, and like 97 countries signed it. The U.S. was not one of them. So they're like, nah, children don't have any rights. Blah. <laughs> so, um, so when we 
perform this as a thesis, um, we invited a bunch of parents with kids, um, and we just said, did this work? And the parents said over and over again, we can't believe that our seven-month-old or nine-month-old sat through a performance um, for like 30 minutes, you know? And, and it wasn't like staring at a screen, and it wasn't like they were, you know, like, you know, like, you know, staring at a bright light. Um, there was like real deep engagement. And so from that, we kind of said, well, let's create an organization that will actually create theaters for babies. Um, so like small human theater. Um, and it's completely the opposite of technology in some ways because the thing that we're absolutely trying to get at the heart at is what is the connection between one human and another when they they can't tell you what they're thinking. Great question. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Yeah, it's and it's like for for theater people, they were like, "This is the best feedback ever, right?" <laughs> like, um, uh, and 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 the other part that I kind of wanted to push against was this idea that if you create works for children, you were kind of a subpar artist, right? That you were not serious. That you were doing something because the, the adults basically just rejected you. Um, and I felt like that was really wrong because, again, if you believe that you should have access to culture, not only at every socioeconomic level, but also at every age level, then why, as a six-month-old, could you not believe that the most experimental and curious and interesting and plastic of minds wouldn't want to see something that another human had invented? Um, and so we're doing this, and now we're actually going to be partnering with On The Boards to create a small human festival in Seattle, the very first of its kind for, like, ages two and younger. Woo! Um, Woo Send me the dates. Yes. I want to make sure I come back. Yeah, and one of the things that happens when you are a founder that's not a white male is you're like, we also need to make sure that the people who are performing are the ones that are not just of one homogenous like look that we can actually again at a very critical moment say this is where we need to be inclusive about who gets to sh tell these stories and like what are the people that look like when they're out there um, because you, we all remember that we loved looking at like Sandra O oh and stuff because we were like ah she's the only one that looks like me you know um, and so I, I think that again it's like that's where we 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 pause before we kind of just do something and say what are the other things that are really important at this moment to include at the very beginning so that it's in the DNA of the of the organization. That's fantastic. Thank you. So at this moment, can we, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience, if there are any. Yes, sir. But with a smile, so maybe that helps a little. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, um, yeah, and I think people kind of get jazzed by it. So um, our first investor is a Cerdna Foundation, and we just hosted a series of um, art and technology learning salons for them so they can better understand the space. And we were just in New York, and one of our speakers um, is a woman named Dawn Thomas, and she started what um, what's, she's calling a transmedia company, um, transmedia storytelling called Koi, and it's all about um, showcasing the sort of amazing, rich, beautiful lives of women of color. And like, like she kept saying, like they're cool, they're hip, they go shop, they go hiking. This is like I'm imitating Don. If Don ever sees this, I love you, Don. But you know, she's like, they're amazing, and like it's not all about us being like, oh, we're so little, woe is me. But like her presentation was beautiful because she literally has created these multi-dimensional characters. Her, her, her background is in film and she's also a coder and she worked with Will Smith and she has a really great story herself. But 
she talks about just how do we showcase these beautiful women living their lives. You get to follow them. You get to, like, go down to the cafe with them. You get to see where they are in New York. You get to see some AR experiences where they are. You get to, oh, you love her dress? Oh, you can buy this dress right now at h and Like, you want to go hiking? Oh, you want to actually, like, model? You want that furniture? So it's just interesting. You want to follow them on social media? They all have, like, it's this amazing, rich universe she's created of these women that's also involving, like, retail. So she's got a lot of corporations that are totally like, oh, women? Like, women of color? huge demographic buying power is huge I don't have the numbers right now off the top of my head but I think there's also a sense of mainstream media realizes that these again people in the margin people of color actually are great for business I mean there's research to show that and so I think for Dawn if she were here she would say there there's an amazing opportunity you know and how do we live in a state of abundance Mm -hmm. and not one of scarcity and I think it's also like a conversation around like world building. Let's just create the worlds that we want to live in, that we believe to be true, and it doesn't have to always be like <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> I think there's also a sense of you know you know when you have a, a challenging situation, you can confront it head on, and you can also sidestep it and be like, you be, fine, you can have these other narratives that are blah or you know whatever we've heard them over and over again and be like and and right so the conjunction is and we can do these other things so uh and and we're not and i I guess one of the things that make the technology can do is actually say if we democratize these spaces then we don't have to necessarily appeal to just this that we can do our own thing and make it very much our own and it it still lives on the same equal footing as, as, as as other narratives um, so I, I feel like that's part of the energy and dynamic, and it is true. It's like, I, it's not Facebook where all you're doing is complaining, right? We're not, we're not just complaining about what we feel like is, is a stagnant status quo, but saying, I actually have this really awesome thesis about how to make it better. Um, so, yeah. Great. Uh, last questions? Yes. Yeah, go up first. Well, I mean, there's now kind of the structure, and I don't really know how, uh, in, in terms of whether or not it's trending and trending in popularity, is this idea of also setting up B corporations, right, where you have so we something. Are. Aha! See? Ta-da! Um, so, you know, something like that, I think, can again, you know, from the very beginning of the, or, you know, the origins of the organization, think about that you have, um, you know, very sophisticated equity missions in addition to making a, you know, making a profit. Um, I think for the for the app that we're working on right now, one of the things that we're absolutely thinking about is the how do we create models so that money flows to the creators of these stories, so that it's not actually the company that basically says we own all your information and therefore we we control everything and they get the money, but it is really like where are the vectors we can create to actually bring the money back, and that's absolutely possible. That still has you know profit as it's, you know, as, as one of its goals? Um, one organization is called Zebras Unite. Um, I wanted to see how they talk about themselves, but Zebra Unite, Zebras Unite calls, <laughs> can I talk? Zebras Unite calls for a more ethical, inclusive movement to counter existing startup and venture capital culture. So the idea of zebra is the opposite of the unicorn, you know, in startup world. Um, amazing women lead it. We actually brought some of them to our salon. So I, they, publish a lot of resources. Um, SOCAP is also a good resource. They have an annual conference. They talk about sort of what is social impact funding and investment. Um, and yeah, we have our public benefit corporation certif- certification and this cooperative model, we're working with lawyers in Denver right now to figure out what a multi-stakeholder cooperative looks like, whereby, um, you know, the 
the arts world. It's like the intellectual property conversation, all of that. Like we're producing art, and yet artists are never getting really compensated for their work. But if these multi-stakeholder groups are all owners and co-managers of Crux, right? So it's not about Lauren and I, my co-founders, sort of making a lot of money. It's about how do we all sort of split that and support um, that success. So if one artist is putting content up, content up on our platform, we all benefit from that. Um, and so we would have different stakeholder groups like artists, black arts organization, technologists, investors. So we're really coming up with this interesting model. So I would love to just stay in touch with you and share resources as I'm, as I'm learning to. Um, and maybe our website at some point will have some of those resources listed. We'll be thinking up our website. So, yeah. Do you want to do your website? Crux.black. Uh, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank Dave you. And Susie. Thank you very much, everybody. So we have one last speaker, which I will introduce as um, Susie and Davina exit at their will. Um, so I would like to introduce as our last speaker, um, Ahame Fulo Oluo, Seattle musician, writer, comedian, filmmaker. I'm sure he's not a stranger to most of you from Seattle. He was also the first artist in residence here at Town Hall, I believe. So um, I'm going to hand the stage over to Aham. Thank you. Hey, everyone. How's it going? It's so great to be here. What a wonderful event. Uh, it's great to be back at Town Hall. It looks beautiful. Uh, Thank you, Mayan, for having me. It's such an honor. Um, I am here to get revenge. Uh, I have a celebrity beef. Uh, my beef is with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I know that that sounds like the setup to a joke. And there, there is a joke involved, but the beef itself is very real. Neil deGrasse Tyson insulted me specifically. He besmirched my good name. And I will not stand for it. Uh, and I'll explain all of that in a minute, but before I do that, I want to tell all of you the first joke that I fell in love with. When I say that, I don't mean the first thing that I found funny. I mean the first joke that I fell in love with. Uh, and this joke comes from the comedian Jonathan Katz, who's uh, most well known for his 1990s animated television series, Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist. Uh, but this joke actually comes from an earlier stand-up special of his from the early 90s. I must have been somewhere between 10 and 12 when I first heard this joke. Um, so this is it. A young polar bear comes home from school. True story. Uh, and he goes up to his dad. And he says, Dad, am I a real polar bear? And his dad says, what are you talking about? Of course. Go in the other room. And the young polar bear goes into the other room, and he goes up to his mom. He says, Mom, am I a real polar bear? She says, of course, honey. Of course you are. And he says, so I just want to get this, this straight. I am 100% polar bear. You and Dad are both 100% polar bear, and everyone in our family going back forever is 100% polar bear. And the mom polar bear is like, yeah, that, of course. Why do you keep asking these questions? And the young polar bear says, because I'm fucking freezing. <laughs> That's it. That's the joke. The joke starts out with a young polar bear questioning the very core of who he is and where he comes from. And those questions are answered with almost nothing. It's so delightfully insignificant. It's so frivolous, so human. Uh, and that joke just connected with me so much. And even when I think about that joke, even today, it still makes me laugh. So back to my story. Uh, a few years ago, I uh, wrote a very harmless joke about Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I posted it on Twitter. Normally, that would be the end of that situation, but my dear friend, the comedian Hari Kondabolu, uh, was being interviewed by Esquire magazine, and they asked him 
what is your favorite joke that you've heard recently? And he told them my very harmless joke about Neil deGrasse Tyson. And then they printed that joke in Esquire magazine in a national publication, and I was very proud. Uh, so cut to a little bit later. So my friend Hari is a comedian, which means that he has like nine podcasts. That's the way that, that works. And, uh, and it just so happened that uh, one day on his podcast, he had as a guest Neil deGrasse Tyson. And uh, with Neil there, he decided to take that opportunity to tell Neil the very harmless joke that I had written about him. So he told Neil deGrasse Tyson my joke, and Neil deGrasse Tyson hated it. Uh, he said that it was too long, and it didn't pay off at the end. Uh, and then he went a step further, and he offered a joke that he said was better than my joke. Uh, so what I would like to do with the rest of my time here uh, <laughs> is I would like to, no heckling at a symposium, uh, <laughs> I would like to share Neil deGrasse Tyson's joke that he says is better than my joke. Uh, and then I'm going to share my joke uh, about Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I will let you decide which is a better joke. Okay, so here is the joke that Neil deGrasse Tyson said is better than my joke. Why can't you trust atoms? Does anyone know this one? They make up everything. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. They make up everything. Now, it is not a coincidence that some random Yahoo in the audience knew the answer to that joke. Uh, it is what's called a street joke. It was written a hundred years ago and has since lived on the inside of candy wrappers and on sign teachers' walls uh, since that time, and it is of no significance. Uh, so now I would like to share the joke that I wrote, and I know what you're thinking. Aham, uh -huh, this has been a very long, strange story. There's no way that your joke about Neil deGrasse Tyson, that Neil deGrasse Tyson didn't even like, is going to live up to all the hype that you've given it here. But I disagree with you. I think that even with all this, I will tell you this joke and it will do everything that it's intended to do. Okay. So this is my joke. What do you call Neil deGrasse Tyson pouring champagne all over his naked chest? An astrophysi tits. <laughs> That's right, Neil. That's right, Neil. No one laughed at your dumb Adam shit. Uh, so, uh, again, this isn't really so much uh, of a talk. It's more about revenge and, uh, and going around and taking every opportunity uh, to tell Neil deGrasse Tyson to stay in his lane. Thank you very much, everyone. So everybody here concludes our uh, symposium for the Saturday afternoon. Thank you for being with us on a beautiful day. It was really great to have you in the audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.